under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Liberty and justice for all. You may say. This wording varies slightly from the original, which yields compassion. Com Compassion Magazine in Boston drew up Columbus Day. Almost 50 years later, the Pledge of Allegiance received official recognition in Congress on June 22, 1942. And they were added the phrase under God on June 14, 1954. President Eisenhower said, we are affirming the transcendency of religious faith in America's heritage and future. This way we shall continuously strengthen those spiritual weapons which forever will be in our country's most powerful resource in peace and war. Thank That's you so it. much, Cynthia Segura, for leading us in the flag salute and, and uh, sharing that with us tonight, um, the history of the flag salute. We'll go ahead and move on to our agenda item 4.2 roll call. We have board member uh, Cruz Gonzalez. We have board member uh, Rodriguez Pena. Present. We have board member Bo. Here. We have board member Greer. Here. And board member Arianes, I am here. And thank you guys all for, for being here. Now we move on to 4.3, approval of the agenda. One of the things I would like to go ahead and Mention, uh, I'm so sorry, let me, let me start over. Uh, approval, that, can I get, please get a first? I motion. Second. We have a first by uh, Ms. by board member Rodriguez Pena. We have a second by board member Greer. One thing that I would like to go ahead and discuss, actually just share is we're gonna go ahead and table 10.2 to meeting on May 4th. That is the only thing on the, agenda that we will go ahead and table. Any discussion, comments? If we can go ahead and vote. And it passes five zero. And let's move to 5.0, report action of closed session matters. At this point, there are no report action items of closed session to report at this time. We'll move on to 6.1. This is public comment on agenda or non-agenda items from our public. Ms. Lika, do we have yes, public we, comments? We do have uh, five hands raised. Um, first is uh, Nancy Sharma. Nancy, you may unmute your mic. Uh, are we supposed to, um, is, uh, is the board closure, school closure part of the agenda? Because um, I think I accidentally clicked that. You can, you can start your comments now, Nancy. Okay, uh, I wrote a letter about the school closure requesting you to please not close my school. Would it be okay if I read that out? Yes, you may. The moment I heard my principal announce a school closure, I felt terrible. I can say this with confidence that Dalton is my second home and it will always remain my, in my heart even after 20 or 30 years. Honestly, I have been enrolled in this school ever since I was in kindergarten. I can still remember my shy voice greeting the strangers I now can call my friends. My older sister had been enrolled in Dalton ever since I had watched her. I knew where I would want to start my education. Dalton had been part of my life ever since I could learn how to walk. The school has been with me through those happy, fun-filled days and those sorrow-filled rainy days. I'm willing to attend the school until my graduation. But it isn't all about me. This is about the other students who have been attending this exact school and making friends and memories ever since they came. I can't say that everyone I can't say that everyone feels strongly about school closure. 
that I can say that Dalton hasn't given neither the students nor the parents any trouble. Instead, the school has helped whether it was to arrange money or have a celebration. The school is more of a family than just a bunch of classrooms. My memories are filled with very deep emotions. And if we think about just how one person's memories can mean so much of them, then Dalton is home to hundreds of students, each with thousands of memories. So it is my humble request to reconsider your, your decision for closing my second home, Dalton. Thank you for letting me read this. Thank you, Miss Nancy Sharma for, for your comments. Next we have is Diane Reese. Hello, are you able to hear me? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay, thank you. Good evening, school board members, Superintendent Ortega, district officials and viewers. My name is Diane Reese, and I'm a 32-year veteran teacher from Dalton Elementary in our district. I recall speaking at a previous school board meeting on February 16th a few months ago, offering insights toward the potential to reopen schools this year. Although many groups were formed to discuss how to approach the final steps, my suggestion for our district to offer a parent survey was heard and implemented within a week. It is a testimony to witness that our voices are being heard in these meetings, such as my own, and will be considered for future decisions. The lens of how we see our professional worlds intertwined throughout a school year, where they are stretched only as far as our own involvement in the decision-making process. A reorganization committee was formed with a diverse group of 30 members addressing the foreseeable need to restructure our school-wide plan based on declining enrollment. The discussion to repopulate at key school sites and maximizing capacity is serious, a very serious challenge for the committee and the school board as well. Models three or four will lead the decision to how many schools or whom to close. The school board will determine how soon to implement the selection of the school closure tiered process for the upcoming school year, whether it is 2021, 22, or if it is uh, the following year. Every school in this district is invaluable. Let's go deeper. Every employee at a school site, administrator and district personnel is invaluable. But the key to every school is the children who walk onto the campus with a desire to learn and see their own school in their own neighborhood. The school provides the catapult for the children, families and communities to see their vital role in their home away from home field so children can learn and make lifetime friendships. I can describe the same quality for all of our schools, but Dalton is small but mighty. Sometimes the strength of the school isn't in the size, but the quality of its programs, dedication, and the extent to which you become family within the families. Whether Dalton's capacity number fits the model for the committee's proposal or the school board, sometimes a quaint hometown feel is what is needed for our students. If I could leave a message, for any of the reorganization committee and the school board members who vote in the near future, please consider, consider the dynamics of how quality impacts our capacity for lifetime success. Thank you for this opportunity to speak my views this evening and have a good evening. Thank you, Ms. Diane Reese for your comments. Next we have Jennifer. Yes, um, good evening, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, good evening, uh, President Arianas, board members, Superintendent Ortega and district officers. My name is Jennifer Verone and I've been a teacher for Azusa Unified for over 31 years. Many of those were at Slauson. And when I was uh, told that I would need to choose an elementary, I did my research. I asked many community members, staff, teachers, parents, and even students, which school they thought I should move to. They all pointed in one direction, towards Dalton. Now, having been a part of Dalton staff for a, this coming year, this year, I have known why they all were pointing that way. What Laura Clark, Greg Cahill, and the entire staff has built is extremely unique. 
as uh, Diana Ruiz mentioned, all of the schools are valuable. No one wants to see their school close. However, I would ask of the committee and the board members to take a look at Dalton. At Dalton, there's a small community feel, a tight knit feel where kids are thriving as Nancy Sharma beautifully spoke about. They're happy, they're laughing, and it is such a unique community. Parents come on campus with a huge smile to meet Laura Clark. And I always believe that environment is shaped from principal on down. Everyone feels like family at Dalton. Perhaps instead of looking at capacity and numbers, we should be looking at the type of school that we offer. And perhaps instead of having all large campuses, we do offer some variety. There are some children that will thrive in a smaller, tight-knit community. We'd like to keep families in Azusa. That is our main goal, not to lose our families. We all want Azusa to thrive in numbers, but perhaps we should offer diversity. Please, I consider you to take a look at Dalton and keeping Dalton open because of its small, tight-knit family community. Thank you very much for letting me speak tonight. Thank you, Ms. Jennifer Brown for your comments. Next, we have Ms. Kathleen Shahanian. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. I don't know why my picture is there, but okay. I recently watched the school reorganizing team meeting last week, which is why I am speaking with you tonight. As a 33 year educator in the Azusa Unified School District, I have the benefit of institutional memory and I want to share it with you tonight. When I first began my career at Ellington, we were a K-6 school. Then the district decided to move to sixth grade, move the sixth grade to the junior high. We then became a K-5 school. As time went by, our sixth graders were leaving the Azusa Unified School District and going to the neighbor's, neighboring district, which is Covina. As you know, Ellington School is located in Covina. We didn't want our students to leave our district, so a plan was created to help our students stay in Azusa Unified. Much research, parent input, and extensive meetings were held. A decision was made and Ellington became a K-8 school. Then the district decided to put transitional kindergarten students at all sites. Ellington became a TK-8 school. During the meeting last week, Ellington School was mentioned many times. However, Ellington School's location was hardly mentioned. I am speaking tonight because I know that if Ellington School's elementary students are asked to move to other locations, our students will go to Covina. Our parents will not want to drive to another school in Azusa when Covina is a city in which they live. Here are some possible solutions to keep Ellington students who reside in Covina to stay in Azusa Unified. Ellington School could become a TK-5 school, TK-6 school, or TK-8 school. I hope it remains a TK-8 school. It is modernized and already a TK-8 school. Why would the district spend money to make another school a TK-8 when Ellington is ready to go? Lastly, this pandemic has taught us that social, emotional well-being is extremely important. All Azusa Unified School District students are anxious to get back to school. Making a dramatic change in student locations would be traumatic to students. Now more than ever, stability, routine, and continuity are extremely important. I am sure you would agree that students should always come first. I will send each of you a copy of this and hope you will be able to take my recommendations into consideration. Feel free to reach out to me if I can be of help. Thank you for this opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you so much for your comments tonight, Ms. Kathleen Shahinian. Next, we have Ms. Vicki Davis. Good evening, dear board members. I am grateful for the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Vicki Davis, and I'm an English teacher at Azusa High School. Today, I would like to talk to you about two things. The first is a heartfelt thank you for adding agenda item 9.1 the naming of the Azusa High School Theater, the Dave H. Lewis Theater of the Performing Arts. Your vote to make the name change will be appreciated by the entire Azusa community. As I mentioned at the last board meeting, we have over a thousand people who would like to see the name change. 
Thus, your support is important to us. Mr. Dave Lewis's legacy will live on with every scholar who participates in the theater program at Azusa High School, regardless of whether that individual is an actor performing on his or her first production, a stagehand, or an attendant. The lessons that Mr. Lewis taught our scholars continue to live in those he touched with his kindness, joy, and enthusiasm. His presence is missed by those who knew him. The second item I would like to address is my appreciation for denouncing and combating racism, xenophobia, and intolerance against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. I was moved by the opening words of the approved resolution 20-2127, denouncing xenophobia due to COVID-19. When I heard the board read the resolution in a carousel format stating, Azusa Unified School District believes that we have a special responsibility to understand and intentionally work to eliminate racism, it was inspiring to me. I was also delighted to see Superintendent Ortega's April 14th email message where he said, we are all committed to respect, equity, and justice. And with that thought of respect, equity, and justice, I wanna say thank you to the board and the cabinet for everything you are doing for our district and our students. I appreciate all your efforts. Thank you, Ms. Vicki Davis for your comments. Next, we have Mr. Daniel. Testing, is everything clear on your end? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, hello, Miss um, Arianis. Um, hopefully your children are doing well. Um, my name Thank is Daniel you. Alberto, aka Mr. Daniel. I'm a program leader at Dalton Elementary School. I'd like to first start with the prelude of two school years ago. We've had the closure of a few of our schools, which is a president, precedent, such as Gladstone Street. And I worked at that school. I get transferred to Dalton Elementary School. Very nervous about making a good impression. I come to you today speaking because I feel that this school has a lot more to offer than just the size of it. I understand that as administrators, you have to look at the business side of these things. However, it, it, the word I choose to use is an investment. I would never speak of Dalton if I did not feel it's a school that I very much believed in. And two years prior as well, there was a re-election and I would like to point to you school board and say that we, the city of Luda, parents, faculty members, we voted for you to be in your positions and history repeats itself of more school closures. And I ask, how will you explain to these children that they need to walk farther distances, that the locations of school that they rely on for free lunch or, or meals will no longer be there for them? the teacher that they've known, the friend that they knew, will no longer be part of their life. Change is scary, whether it's you're young or you're old. The unknown is a scary thing. And just think about these changes, these drastic changes that parents, students, faculty will have to go through. I would not speak for Dalton if I did not believe in this school, nor its staff, to go up to Miss Laura Clark and ask how she is doing while she fights back her tears, to say that everything will be fine when I know in her eyes, she, she just can't hold it back. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Daniel, for, for your comments tonight. Next, our last speaker, we have Michaela. Michaela, are you there? Yes. 
Hi, Michaela, you can go ahead and start when you're ready. Okay. I think Dalton is a beautiful place and I really want it to stay open because I see my parents laugh when I get home and I see every kid laugh and everybody loves the school. I know people want to close the school, but it's just a beautiful place when I see everybody smile and I, I see the teachers work so hard so many times. And I obviously love how they talk and how they take care of us and they have courage to be themselves and yeah that's all thank you Michaela are, did you want to speak anymore or, or are you done I'm done okay thank you so much Michaela for for your comments tonight next we have Miss Esther Campos Ball Hello, um, I hope that everyone can hear me. Um, board member yes. Arianas, thank you. And cabinet members, rest of the board. Um, I would like to take this opportunity. I wasn't going to speak tonight, um, but listening to Nancy and Michaela and Jennifer, Diane um, and Daniel really made me um, move to speak. And as you know, I. I very seldom approach the board for any issues, um, but as I begin, I'd like to um, first of all, thank the board and the cabinet for putting uh, Mr. Dave Lewis's uh, name change for the theater first is a high on the agenda for tonight for vote. Um, I know that there are a thousand plus folks um, that are probably listening to this meeting tonight. We're very much appreciating the fact that you considered to vote on the issue. So thank you very much for that. But as a community member, I wanna speak about um, Ellington and Dalton and the impact that they have in our community. But most importantly, I wanna speak about the loss of students and the loss of students to our district if we should close those two school sites. Um, I know and I truly understand Fan the responsibility, the fiscal responsibility that is behind the decisions that our district has to make. But when we talk about closing two schools that are essentially vital to our district and the loss of students that we could possibly face because of the fact um, that we're closing schools in, in areas that could very easily feed into Covina School District or Glendora, um, as a community member and a faculty member of this district, it brings me great concern, um, extreme concern, not only for, you know, the fact that our students are going to be having to be reshifted, but also because of the fact that we have a huge potential, potential, excuse me, to lose students to Glendora and Covina. And I think we've bled enough students already. And knowing the community of Dalton as well as I do, I can, I can almost guarantee you that these kids will end up going to other districts. And with that said, uh, board members, when the <laughs> item does come up for vote, I really would like for you, all of you to consider that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Esther Campos Ball, for your comments tonight. Do we have anyone else raising their hand at Liga? We have no more hands at this time. At this time, we move on to our next item, which is 7.1 comments, reports, and requests by the Board of Education. We'll go ahead and start with Board Member uh, uh, Cruz Gonzalez. Thank you. Um, since we met a week ago, I have nothing else to add today. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have board member Rodriguez Pena. Yes, hello. Uh, good evening, everyone. Just want to report that I, I went to a, a, the walkthrough through at Murray Elementary School, and I can see why the LA County has given our district an A. 
I give them an A score because everything was so organized, so neat. The PPE um, was set up perfectly. The water fountains were very clean. I uh, did to the whole uh, walkthrough from the beginning. Like if I was a student going in, what would happen? They take my temperature, they walk to the cafeteria, but I also uh, looked into a classroom and it was quite odd to see. I mean, it's almost historical. You see the teacher sitting at one end and she has her shield in front of her with a mask. And then across are her students and they're sitting there with masks and shields in front of them. And, and it's it's different look, you know, and we used to be able to walk into the classroom and, you know, see the students um, in session. But we literally had to look in through a window. So I just want to thank um, Superintendent Ortega and Principal Jeanette Flores for um, giving me that great walkthrough because it's, I really see um, why our scores are so high every time the LA County comes in and looks at our schools. Cause I know all our, all our other schools are consistently doing the same thing. Um, also, um, Azusa Leaders for Learning Educational Foundation has partnered with Azusa Unified School District in purchasing, if you have seen banners that say they read, you are amazing. Um, it's a small token of our appreciation of our appreciation. And you know, if you don't have it at your school site yet, you will be getting them sometime this week. Um, because I've seen them at several schools. And uh, we do know that you are amazing. Uh, Gladstone High School. One thing I noticed that um I haven't been out much, but I was driving down Arrow Highway and I noticed they're finally putting a three-way signal right on Eden. Um, Arrow Highway going west and Eden crosses and it, it would take forever to get across. And I know the, the community and the parents have asked her, I don't, I don't know how it happened, but um, I guess they're listening. And I noticed they're putting it, the signal on and um, it's safer. I mean, I used to go to get my, my grandkids all the way to the other side, just to come to the back way because making that left was like, Either took forever or good luck if you went across. Um, and I noticed that I've also seen the crossing guards out. Um, nice to see them out working again. And I want to thank the city of Azusa because I know they are being paid and put there through the city of Azusa. Thank you. Thank you, board member Rodriguez Pena for your comment. Next, we have board member Bo. Um, I would like to share that uh, in partnership with Assemblywoman Blanca Rubio's office and community-based organizations, Heart of Compassion and City of Refuge, Azusa Unified will be hosting a food distribution drive on Saturday, May 1st at our former adult education site located at 1134 South Barranco, where we have hosted several food drives uh, in the past and very recently. The drive will open at 9 a.m. and we will be ready to distribute fresh food to 400 families on a first come first serve basis. I look forward to a great turnout from our community volunteers and I hope you can all join. Thank you. Next we have board member Greer. Good evening, everyone. Just a, a couple of reminders. I, I mentioned these last week. Uh, the first is there is a DACA clinic happening this Saturday um, in, in partnership with the Immigration Resource Center, Homer House, Foothill Community Church and my third place. It'll be Saturday, uh, this Saturday, April 24th, from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Um, at Foothill Community Church. Again, the space is going to be open for, for anyone who might want to be, be, you know, walk through the, the DACA process. There will be attorneys on hand to, to review documentation and ensure that, that everything is, is, is uh, up, to, up to speed. If you are interested, again, I want to uh, encourage you to reach out to me, and, and I can... Um, work with you and connect you with Immigration Resource Center to make sure that you have the, the needed documents. If that's something that you're, you're wanting to do, um, you can reach out to me again. My phone number is 626-629-8061. Uh, feel free to call me or text me. Uh, you can also email me at uh, agreer at azusa.org. Uh, and then finally, um, I will be having a, a coffee online a week from today on Tuesday, April 27th at 6 p.m. If you've attended one in, in the past, uh, you, you should have by now received an email with, with the link to, to sign up. Uh, they should also be on, on some of the social media channels uh, that, that, I, that I have. You can check them out there, or again, reach out to me if you'd like to be included 
and I'll make sure that you get the uh, Zoom credentials. But that will be next week, Tuesday, April 27th on uh, at 6 p.m. Great, thank you. And thank you for your comments. I, I would like to go ahead and remind everyone that this Saturday, April 24th at 5.30, you're all invited to Stop Asian Hate Rally that is being sponsored by Mayor Robert Gonzalez and in partnership with our school uh, board. You guys are all invited to come and participate. I would love to see you guys there. Um, I think this is a great opportunity. Uh, April 5th, the city passed their resolution. Um, last week, we passed our resolution in unison, together, unified, to stop the xenophobia that is happening. And this is our first time actually doing this um, here in our city, you know, with um, residents that live here. So I, I would like to invite you guys at home to please come and, you know, stand together with us in solidarity against xenophobia happening towards our fellow um, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And um, other than that, I have nothing else to report. We'll go ahead and move on to comments and reports by student board members. We have Destiny Contreras. Good evening. GHS welcomed back students in the classrooms with teachers yesterday for the first time in over a year. Crystal Flamino, Olivia Britt, Mario Valenzuela, Gianni Morales, Karen Moreno, and myself set up balloons and posters around the school, as well as repainted our happy rock to welcome everyone back. We hope to see more gladiators in the coming weeks as we all try to finish the year strong. Shout out to Ms. Perdomo, Ms. Parmar, Ms. Neal, and all the other teachers motivating students to finish the year out strong. GHS is proud of the gladiator football team who played Azusa High School last Friday. Coach Lopez led his team to a 22 to eight victory and his players dem demonstrated respect and sportsmanship over the course of the game. We would like to thank the Aztecs for their hospitality and a chance to play on their beautiful new field. GHS would like to congratulate members of the Gladstone HOSA who, completed, who competed in the HOSA State Leadership Conference on April 9th through 10th and had all the members go to the second round of the competition. Anthony Echeverria was awarded the bronze medal, medal in the Barbara James Scholarship Competition. This award is given to members that have the highest number of volunteer hours through the year. Anthony worked tires, tire, tirelessly to give his time and dedication to hospice patients. The other honor was fifth place in cultural diversity and disparities exam competition. Leticia Perez put all her time in studying and learning the material to be able to get to this level. GHS would like to congratulate Mario Valenzuela Jr. for a gold mem medal in Skills USA state level competition and Matthew Tellez for a silver medal in Skills USA state level competition. Their progress in graphic arts facilities management has earned them a place in Skills USA national competition. JHS would like to recognize Ms. Wall, Ms. Flores, Mr. Infante, Ms. Parmar, Ms. Casanave, Ms. Alvarez, Mr. Shea, Mr. Velasquez, Ms. Clavesia, Ms. Poole, and Mr. Haig for their hard work this week in the project-based learning leadership cohort with high tech, high mentors. Even as we reopen for in-person learning, these gladiators remain committed to continuous improvement and developing their crafts as teachers. GHS athletes would like to thank Azusa Unified Bus Drivers for their service to get them to competitions over the last month. Football, boy soccer, girls soccer, and girls tennis have ha all had away games against league opponents. Right. Got off. Riding the bus with the windows down and socially distanced is the way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Destiny Contreras. I, I, I want to just uh, uh, congratulate you on how you uh, 
you're from Azusa High and you're making uh, congratula- uh, congrat- make it a congratulations to, to Gladstone um, because yeah. in reality, you know, we may be two schools, but we're one city, one unified city. So thank you for that. And Next I want to ask you a question, Destiny. Okay. Are you students still to put the mask on the happy rock? Yes, we put it on the rock. I saw that. <laughs> that, was, that was cute. Thank that you. Was really cute. <laughs> and the tradition continues. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. It was cute. Um, thank you. Jacob Vasquez. I do not see Jacob here this evening. He did mention that he had a game and might be running late. No worries. We'll go ahead and uh, move to Alex Arkenberg. Good evening, board members, cabinet, and superintendent Ortega. Just before spring breaks, serious students, parents, and staff participated in our second trimester virtual award ceremony. Students who are recognized for academic excellence, academic achievement, honor roll, and attendance. Over 60 students received awards and recognized and were recognized for their hard work. Thank you to all the parents who were able to attend and help make this a special event. Students and teachers safely returned to campus yesterday. The custodian and office staff worked hard to make sure the classroom hallways and restrooms were ready for students to return. Finally, we are proud to announce that Sierra High School has been recognized as one of the 27 schools in the state of California as a model continuation high school. Congratulations to the teachers for making Sierra High a place where students receive a high quality education. Thank you. Yeah. Yay. Congratulations, Sierra High School. That's That speaks volume, volume of our administration, our teachers and you students putting in that effort. So congratulations, that, that's well-deserved. Next, we'll go ahead and move to comments and reports by cabinet and superintendent. Good evening, board members, staff, and community members. Uh, I'll be brief. Um, I just want to share that the highlight of my year has been visiting and supporting sites as we resume in-person instruction. Uh, seeing students back in the classrooms has uh, been the highlight by, by far and away. So I just want to thank everyone who's been involved. Um, this is an effort that has taken many, many people. Um, and I, I, I don't think we could say thank you enough. Um, I also wanna recognize and express my appreciation to our human resources team that has been working on a variety of issues, uh, especially leave um, and filling vacancies um, as they've come up and they've been coming up quite a bit. So I wanna thank my staff for, for all the work that they're doing. Um, that is it. Uh, thank you. Good evening, board and community. Um, in the business department, we are continually knee deep, elbows deep, and developing the 21-22 budget. Um, there's a lot of factors that's going into that, and we're working on changing our uh, or improving our budget philosophy as well as how we incorporate uh, feedback and input from our like our site administrators, our department heads, and vice versa. Um, additionally, we are working hard to improve our meal offerings. So we're looking into seeing how we can have more digital signage as well as identifying meals in advance so people can have options as well as maybe looking into having some samples if COVID guidelines allow it. So we have some food tasting to get some input from our community as well as our parents and students. Additionally, um, our MOT department is still working to assess all of our facilities. Um, at times we're looking to see exactly the capacity of all of our units, electrical, plumbing, vice versa. So we can make those decisions to come up with a five-year facility plan so we can reassess things. Uh, most districts, they go out and contract the company out. Uh, we haven't closed the doors on that, but we are trying to see how we can create this level re report internally before we reach out. Um, but I want to continue to thank our team for our hard work and our efforts. Um, I do want to give um, kudos to our transportation department. We are one of the few districts that did continue to have transportation and we are we were successful at offering transportation for all our athletics internally versus having a contract out. So I wanna thank all the ladies and I can say that because we have all female drivers. So woo, I wanna thank all of our ladies for showing up and being there and just being a, a smiley face for our students when they pick them up for school as well as for athletics. So thank you. This week, uh, we welcome back uh, at, our, 
at our elementary sites, our fifth and sixth grade uh, students. And I have had the pleasure to uh, be at sites to do uh, arrival duty and dismissal duty uh, to help out and to be visible there and to see our kids on campus. Uh, this week, we also uh, welcome back our secondary students, uh, 7 to 12. Uh, yesterday, I was at Azusa High School, and today I was at Foothill Middle School. Um, I want to share that today I overheard uh, teachers uh, talking, and a teacher said that yesterday um, she was able to help three students raise their grade uh, in one TIM session. And so um, just how awesome that is when you have that that one on one connection and that support uh, to see those kinds of out outcomes. So kudos to uh, to that teacher uh, this week. We continued uh, with our Los Angeles County Department of Public Health uh, visits uh, from the inspectors. And we continue on the path of impressing, uh, we continue on the path of uh, uh, doing well. Um, we are expecting that our secondary schools uh, will begin to get phone calls and um, and uh, schedule visits for that. And so we welcome that um, that opportunity to showcase our secondary schools uh, as well. And so um, I just want to thank all of the staff members uh, who have contributed uh, to this uh, this success uh, in Azusa. So thank you. Good evening, I am excited to announce that AUSD is launching a project-based learning collaborative team. So we just started and so far we have 24 K through 12 teachers who have signed up to participate where we're going to engage in exploration of project-based learning, learn how to implement in classrooms and collaboratively plan projects and then share our learning. Um, as you heard tonight, GHS has been engaged in um, a project-based learning pilot that has gone very well this year. And so um, we are excited about that and expanding. And we are also excited to share more about project-based learning during our summer learning presentation tonight. Thank you. Great, thank you for all your comments. I, I really appreciate cabinet. You guys always have inf great information um, to share with us. So. And congratulations to our uh, uh, our transportation team. Go, ladies! That that's great to hear. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll move on to general functions nine point one. This is the discussion, the approval of naming of the Azusa High School Theater, the David H. Lewis Theater of the Performing Arts. Thank you, Board President. The board, um, per the Board Policy 7310, um, under the memorial, upon request of the board, um, public comment, as we had in our last board meeting, as well as um, the signatures received from the Azusa community members, as well as faculty and staff and students, we are having this discussion today to allow us to elaborate further on this opportunity. So at this time, I'll pass it back to the board president so we can have further collaboration. Thank you. Can I please get a motion to move 9.1? We make a motion to move 9.1. Great. We have a first by board member Rodriguez Pena. Can I please get a second? Second. We have a second by board member Greer. Do we have any discussion, any comments that you I think it's like well deserved. You know, Mr. Lewis gave 31 years of his um, education working as a con not only as a drama teacher, but as a counselor. And I know that he affected many students also, you know, by showing them their talents. I recall some of the students from um, I used to see them do the plays at Foothill Middle School. And then all of a sudden I see them in high school and they were doing fantastic plays. And it, he gave all the kids the opportunity um you know where to be but he would also be in the place too right so i i think it's very well deserved for mr lewis i think it's gonna be a beautiful honor to him i just ditto i, I echo those those thoughts and, and sentiments as well um i would ask what is there is would there be any type of uh ceremonial ribbon cutting or or, or unveiling is that something that's even feasible um to to, to do in this in this season we would have to see based on the current, um, current COVID guidelines what would be allowable um, okay. and at the same time not make um, others feel isolated or not included in the process. Sure. Okay. 
And would, I'm sorry, would it be a signage or would be something on the wall or his name will be? Yeah, so as far as exactly how uh, the site would like to put it up, we have not determined oh, okay. that, um, but it's going to be up to them. Okay, thank you. I, I would like to comment. Um, you know, Mr. Dave Lewis was a teacher that did not look um, at his check in time, you know, mm -hmm. being 7 30 and clock out time at three. He went way, way beyond because he wanted to give back and empower each one of his students. And it's evident as we are discussing today and as we are going to vote today, how he affected our community as a whole. And I'm, I'm very excited. Um, I thank all of you that have come to the school board meetings, have let us know with your emails how he has affected your lives, how he empowered your child, you as a student. Um, so thank you, thank you so much for that. And for, for the ceremony, I, I, I thank you for sharing that, but I, I think, um, I don't know, I, I would like to probably do something virtual as well. Um, maybe just cabinet and board be there and something virtual for our, our families at home that, that may not be able to be there. What do you guys think? Yeah. I, I also wanted to add, and, and yeah, he, he affect many, many students, but he also affect many parents, especially his favorite drama mamas, which is, <laughs> which is Patricia Sanchez, um, and one of our employees in Dalton, and Dan Ochoa. And that's what he called them because he, they would be serving the popcorn and always be making the hot dogs. They were there every single event. Well, when I when I went, so you know, many parents. He's also affected because he was had parents volunteering all the time. But the drama mamas, that's what he called them, and they were always there for him. So I think I think we're all um, in agreement that mm -hmm. for a ceremony, we would you know uh, I. I as, as board members and cabinet, we would like to be present, mm -hmm. but we would also like some type of virtual for our families, our, our parents and our students to, mm -hmm. to engage in this ceremony. You, I'm sorry, do you mean us be there and do it virtual or do you mean do it virtual? Us, us be there and, and then uh, zoom it to our families at home. Yeah, because of COVID. Yeah, of and course. So forth. That's yeah, yeah. I didn't know we were going to be there. That's yes. yes so I, I, I'm, I'm proposing that you know we we be there physically for those of us that can, um, and uh, that that would be. Um, yeah, I, I, I would I would say, uh, Latasha, if you if you were able to look at just look into what is feasible, you, you know, yeah, what, that that might be do. helpful even to just ascertain. Yes, sir. What what makes the most sense? There may be more options available to us, or or less options available to us if we, yeah. if we look into that. And the date too, because of right when 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 that that will take place. And and if you could just, um, I think it would be great too to to be informed, um, like you said on the, on the signage on on how that that's gonna take you know how that process is gonna we'll unfold. Um, that would be much appreciated as well. Um, are there any members of the Lewis family that we've been in contact with that we would invite to the ceremony as well? Yes, yes we have. And then, and then you need to look at the capacity, right? I mean, how many people can attend? It's like, maybe not all board members could be there, maybe two, I, I don't know. I, yes. I'm just thinking out loud, yes. you know, depending, because I don't know how many family members he has, and I'm sure they should probably be first before right, so us. That's yeah, so that's yeah, why I'm proposing right. that, that yes. we family members cabinet and zoom it to, to families. But like, um, yeah. like you're saying, and board member Greer is saying, there's other possibilities. I mean, I, I'm expecting if we open it up to everybody, it yeah, will have all that. of Sousa there. So yeah. that, that's why I, I, you know, I, I'm also suggesting to yeah. creating a link uh, to Zoom to be able to, um, mm -hmm. you know, have the people at home be part of it as well. Um, through, through Zoom and take our safety. And like I said, maybe only several of us, but I guess they'll let us know can, can be there, not all five. And then with Zoom, we can record and then push out the recording. Like a YouTube? Yeah. 
yeah. so that you know if you can't attend on that day at that time we can push out the recording so the community can watch it whenever they want to access the video I'm, oh sorry i that I, I think that's a great idea yeah yeah um i think that's good we can go ahead and have it on our our youtube channel um so yeah if, if, tasha if you could please get back to us on just uh the program and 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 all those little details that you'll take care of and let us know yes ma'am any more comments uh, suggestions great at this time we can go ahead and please we already motioned we had our discussion if you can please cast in your vote for 9.1 And it passes five zero. Thank you guys so much for this. Thank you community for, for joining us in, in this effort. 9.2, we have school reorganization update. Good evening, uh, board president, uh, board members, staff and community. Uh, tonight we're going to be updating uh, the Board of Education on where we are in terms of our school reorganization process. Um, I want to stress that tonight it's an update. It's just an update uh, to keep the board informed of where we are. Uh, last week uh, we kicked off uh, what we are calling phase two of our school reorganization uh, process with the school reorganization team. Um, and at that meeting last Wednesday, uh, we shared uh, that these are the four objectives. These were going to be the four objectives for that evening. Uh, so we were gonna recap our process. We were gonna re revisit our purpose. Uh, we were gonna understand model uh, four and then understand model three and, and try to gain um, some clarity on, on model three. So just really quickly, again, we took the team uh, through, the, through, through a recap, how we assembled the team, how the team came together, how we have been meeting since November, how we have had, had uh, six meetings uh, so far, how the team in phase one came up with some recommendations uh, and some buts, um, and those were presented to the Board of Education and the Board of Education agreed uh, with the team. We showed those recommendations uh, to the team. Again, this is just to bring the context back. It had been a little while since we had um, met. And so we just wanna make sure that we were all in the same place. These are the same recommendations that came to the Board of Education. We then revisited our purpose. Uh, why are we doing this? Why are we all together uh, spending our Wednesday evenings on a volunteer basis? And we talked about, uh, we're doing this because we're trying to maximize not only our capacity, uh, but also maximize uh, our programs. At this slide, uh, we took a pause uh, at this moment uh, during the school reorganization team, and we let them know that we were now in phase two and uh, that we were now moving into uh, getting more detailed into what uh, these models would look like and what they would include, um, including that when we scrolled up, there were now going to be names attached uh, to models. Uh, we reminded them that during phase one of our work, um, we were bringing an idea. We were bringing a model, uh, but that it that did not mean that whatever we were bringing forward uh, was the best or the brightest, uh, but that it was a starting point uh, for us as a team. Um, we talked about the fact that we brought four models to this team and that team narrowed it down to two. Uh, we talked about the fact that one of the models that we are currently uh, exploring, which is model four, when we came with that idea, our idea was a 612. 
that team recommended it to be a 712. So we wanted to make sure that just like in phase one of this work, uh, whatever we were presenting in no way, shape or form meant that this was the final decision. Um, and we wanted to, 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 to let them know that just like in phase one, uh, this team was gonna have ample opportunity uh, to speak into the models, make recommendations, uh, bring up ideas, uh, generate possibilities, um, and that all of that eventually would get to the Board of Education. Lastly, we reminded them that in case they forgot uh, that they were human and that this was hard work. Uh, we let them know that um, when they saw the detailed plans, that, and that we're gonna have school names on them, that as a human, right, it's understood that there could be a reaction to what they were about to see. Um, maybe they went to a school that's gonna be listed here. Um, maybe their kids go to a school that's going to be listed here. Maybe they work at one of these schools. Maybe they went to, to a school when they were younger. Um, and that that can evoke emotion, right? Whether that's sadness, happiness, anger, frustration, whatever those things are. Um, but we applauded them uh, for their efforts to be as objective as possible and as open as possible as we moved into the second phase. Uh, we lastly uh, let them know that on that night, which was last Wednesday, uh, our objective was to try to understand the models. Uh, we let them know that we were not looking for reactions. We were not looking for likes or dislikes. Uh, we were not even going to be discussing the schools that they were going to be seeing that night. That the objective of that night was just to understand the models that were uh, presented, uh, presented to them. So we started with uh, model four. Uh, and the reason we started with model four is because this model uh, that the team um, came up with uh, didn't have any buts, didn't have any um, things to consider. Um, and so therefore it was the least complicated of the two models that we were going to be discussing on that evening. Uh, we did point out a couple of things to them uh, as we showed this uh, to them. Uh, number one, we pointed out that on the on the right hand side of this uh, of this uh, of what they were looking at, we said, "Look, uh, this is now a three year implementation plan." Um, and we let them know that again. Originally, if we if we went back to phase one, this on the right used to be a five year implementation plan, and so we pointed out that that had been changed per their recommendations and ultimately the board recommendation as well. We also pointed out that in these three columns here on the right-hand side, you will notice that the first year says 21-22. We reminded them that that is one of the things that they wanted to consider and discuss further. And so we let them know that just because it says 21-22 right there, that that was still a, an item of conversation that had to happen in this team because this is something that the team wanted to discuss. Do we begin in 21-22 or do we begin in 22-23? Um, we also let them know that in this model, when they see AHS and GHS here on the bottom left-hand side, uh, that they would notice that it now says 712. It no longer is a 612 because, again, that was recommended uh, by the team and by the Board of Education. Um, and then we let them know that uh, when you see schools on this uh, spreadsheet, uh, there is a number uh, attached to these schools. And we let them know that that number is the number that we were calling the capacity of that school. Uh, we let them know that um, our, initial, um, our initial work uh, at the elementary level uh, took the capacity and subtracted six classrooms. 
And we explained to them that our thinking was that we were going to subtract two classrooms uh, for preschool. Our preschool program continues to grow. Uh, and if we were going to eventually get to something like this, then uh, contracting schools would only mean growth at those particular schools. So we want to, to reserve two rooms for preschools. We want to reserve uh, one room for a library. We want to reserve one room uh, for uh, an innovation lab. And then we wanted to have two rooms uh, that would serve as like flex. Uh, so depending on the site, um, we, have, we have had here in our district, uh, we have had, for instance, uh, parent centers at our rooms. Uh, I'm sorry, at our sites. So is that a consideration? Um, we have uh, special education programs uh, that sometimes are uh, pull out in nature. And so having space for, for those kinds of uh, services. Uh, we have been uh, through the work of uh, uh, Gary and Dana and the Ed Services team um, had um, a McKinley Children's Cer uh, Center. And so we have VAPA teachers who teach band and we have all these other kind of things that happen. And so we kind of just put aside two rooms, kind of TBD. So we explained that that's kind of what we had what we had thought about. Um, we let them know that um, the approach that was taken here was for this model was easy. We started with the 712 and we said, okay, well, 712, uh, there's 3,110 students uh, projected next school year. Um, and that would be uh, all going to the two schools. That left us with 3,764 students projected for next school year. That is at the top. And so we started to look at our schools and at, at, their, at our capacity and, decide, and deciding which and how many of our schools would be able to house that projected number uh, the, following, uh, the following school year. Again, not necessarily knowing at this point in time if we were starting next year or starting the year after. Uh, so you will see there uh, that at the elementary level, based on this initial uh, idea, initial starter, uh, 98, we would 98.87 of our facilities uh, would be um, would be up to capacity at the elementary level. Our high schools or our secondary schools, in this case, our 712s, uh, even by moving 712s into them would still hover around 82.54%. And then based on projections at both the, at, the, at the elementary and at the secondary, of course, that still begins to decline over the course, um, over the course of the year. Um, so again, we just explained the model. Uh, this was not about talking, hey, are these the right schools? Are these the wrong schools? This, this initial on Wednesday was, do you understand how it works? And how, how, it, how it functions. Then we move to model three. Uh, model three uh, was more complicated, as you might recall on the recommendations uh, to the board. This one had a lot of tentacles. Uh, should it be a K-5, should it be a K-6? Should it include a TK-8, should it not include a TK-8? Should it include one middle school or one or two? Should it include uh, one high school or two high schools? Um, and so, uh, we, we said we're going to start kind of looking at that and kind of thinking about how that, how that functions. So based on, on, on the data from, the, from, from them, um, the one area that was probably the most pronounced, um, although it was only a little bit more than half, the team had said that the TK six was the preferred model. And so we decided to start with that uh, because again, that seemed just on the initial data, that seemed to be uh, something that most members or a little bit more than half of members were, were um, in favor of. So we started with this TK five, again, just like the model four, we went over it three years, how it works, the transition, uh, how the schools were, um, were, were chosen. Um, and here we noted that um, if this was a TK-5 model, 
unless we were going to consider construction uh, in a TK-5 model, we would have to have uh, two middle schools. Uh, again, unless we were going to consider construction. And so we just let them know this is how the TK-5 works. And per the TK-5, um, we were going to have to have two six eights. And so we explained to them that based on this, um, again, not saying that this is a final decision or that this is what the way it's going to go down, just bringing the initial idea that this would be, um, these would be the two, the two middle schools. Um, we then moved on to the TK6. Again, explain the TK6 model, how it works, how it functions, uh, the ins and outs. Again, this, this was not about a conversation about the school sites. Um, this was a conversation about, do we understand how the model functions and operates? And we clarified all of this. All along, uh, we paused uh, to take questions of clarification, like, hey, explain this again to me, or uh, how did this function, or, or what is that number again, or how did you come up with this? Um, and we responded to the team as those questions uh, came up. At the, um, we then moved on to, uh, some decision making uh, to kind of get a pulse of where the team, uh, where the team was at, and what they were thinking. Um, and so um, that evening, uh, the team was able to decide that model three uh, would be a TK six model, um, and that it would contain only one middle school. Um, we ran out of time. And so we did not uh, we did not finish model three to clarify model three. And so tomorrow at our next school reorganization team meeting, uh, we will be discussing and talking about um, the TK8 and we will be talking about the high schools. Um, and so the team knows that once we have clarity on what model three looks like, uh, we will then, uh, begin to uh, address the other pieces of these models, uh, which include the programs, the potential drawbacks, the potential benefits, the support staff, uh, the potential budgetary impacts um, with the clear models. Okay, model four, here's the, the additional information. Model three, here's the additional information. And then of course, we would begin having those robust conversations in terms of um, schools, uh, location, you know, those kinds of, uh, those kinds of things. Um, and so that's where we are at. Again, we have our, our, our meeting tomorrow, uh, to address the TKA and the high schools. Uh, and then we move on to the other areas, uh, that the team had wanted to see, uh, in terms of the two models, uh, that we were at. Um, so at this point in time, I turn it over if there are any questions uh, that we can uh, address for, for the board. Yes. Um, do we have any questions, comments, discussion, Dad? Not, not, on, not on this side. Uh, um, time, time ran out. So uh, on, on the other side of the, the rest of the conversation, there will be some questions, but I don't have anything. I actually have have a question. Yes. J just to 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 think about. I I first want to thank you. Um, thank the the committee for their time and being very thorough. All the possibilities um, that have come forward and how it has been able to uh, the committee has been able to uh, pretty much you know, work backwards and, and, and come to, you know, to this, um, as, as we look at all these models, um, you know, one thing that, um, that I see, um, that I, I, I would like to just, you know, uh, point out to ponder, um, 
I, I see all the elementaries um, be real, just grow substantially, right? And so, um, so there, there's a few parents that have moved away from, from, for example, uh, you know, let's say Hodge, they were at 700 at one point, you know, they moved to a smaller school because perhaps their, you know, their child needed that type of environment. So I, I don't see here, um, you know, that, that flexibility. And, and so I, I understand, you know, that we're trying to fill capacity, but at the same time, I think it's important that we also, you know, take the needs of consideration of special needs students um, that need that smaller space, that smaller school. Um, so something to think about. Um, uh, you say TK through eight models. So I, I only see one. That is still a decision to be made tomorrow tomorrow night. Okay. And so we didn't get to that part uh, last Wednesday. Okay. And, and so you said, um, so so once, you know, um, tomorrow you said you're going to talk about the TK8 programs and drawbacks with each model, or, or did I hear that? Tomorrow, um, we are hoping that the team uh, further clarifies model three. And so there's two pending issues on model three. One pending issue is should model three include a TK eight or should it not? So that's the first thing that the, that the team is going to kind of digest and try to speak into. And then the second thing that the team has to address is should model three have one high school or two high schools? And so those will be our objectives tomorrow as we continue to try to get a real understanding of what the model three is going to look like. And is it is it possible to put these models side by side so that we can see them in you know, the pros and cons on both sides? You know, I mean, on one page, is, is that a possibility? Even if it's in the in half by 14, just side by side. Sure. I, mean, I think that that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can compare it. You know. oh, any, anybody else? I have one more thing. Um, you, you mentioned that you're looking at like uh, for one room to be one preschool, innovation lab, or like a flex parent center, uh, you know, special education. I, I, I know um, in each elementary, um, so actually in each school, there are, it, it's very important, you know, and, and I bring this up for our special education students. Um, they get pulled out for OT, speech, RSP, um, when they are mainstream. So um, I, I think that's a high priority, again, for our special education students um, that that is, is needed. Um, parent centers, um, that is just an amazing, I, we didn't have parent centers yeah. 20 years ago. Yeah. You know, when I was, it, even when I was here as a student, I, I think that's a great addition to every single school here mm -hmm. because it's inviting to all our parents to come. And so I, I would like to, to see both of these, um, you know, the special education classroom or whatnot, um, however you want to call it, parent center. I think those are our, our, our need because yeah. our schools are not, are, not, are not schools without our parents bringing their, their students, their children to this school district. So I, I think that's a high, high priority. Well, that's kind of a place where they go, you know, and they have their meetings. And the ones that are set up at the schools that I see, you know, they have like it's comfortable, has couches, and they have guest speakers in there, and they feel that it's somewhere where they can go. They even have computers in there where parents can look at Aries. You know, maybe they don't have a computer at home. Maybe they do now after all this, but you know, um, or they they have taught the parents there, you know, how to look at Aries, how to see their child's attendance, or how to see their grades, middle school, high school parents. So I, I think that's really important that we keep. The parent at centers, you know, I don't know. Um, yeah, they're very important. And uh, and, and the preschool. Uh, mm -hmm. I, we have a preschool. It, it, is a preschool going to continue at, at each site, uh, each elementary? Yes, that would be the plan. Okay, so then we're going to, it looks like it's 
there's going to be more than two rooms then that are going to be needed. I mean, so two rooms right now would house four preschool programs. Um, although we are looking into um, also the possibility of a full year, full day. And so that would be just one room, right? But, um, but, it, but a typical um, preschool program, one room houses two programs because you have your AM and your PM. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah, I just I just want to make sure that we we keep in mind, like I said, you know, uh, special education for the art, you know, for this the the pullout that they they do, parent centers, um, the preschool, I, and so just just to keep that in mind that we uh, don't exhibit and just fill up every room, and that we have flexibility, you know, to to make sure that we have room for these extra extra um, um, things that are taking place at at the mm -hmm. elementaries. Um, other than that, thank you so much for your presentation. If there is any more questions, no. if there's no more questions or comments, we can go ahead and move on. Well, I mean, I do, I do have questions about this. Okay. It's about moral process, right? So, um, so you're anticipating you're going to continue meeting with the committee, right? Um, what, what, it, what are you anticipating bringing to the board? Right, because I, I see certain decisions here that need to be made at some point. So uh, tomorrow, uh, our expectation is that we gain clarity on model three, uh, which then lines us up for uh, the date is not in my head, but whatever that uh, following week, uh, next week, Wednesday, uh, that we would uh, begin the conversations of these other items that the team had requested. Um, I right now those are the only means we have. I, I don't I don't know how I don't know the magic or the or the unmagic that, that might happen. Uh, obviously this is now we're getting into some some real, you know, bigger decisions compared to phase one. Um, so I, I really do not know how to answer that question. We are we're, we're, we're committed to meeting on a weekly basis, um, but because they're so, uh, I'm anticipating that the conversations about <clears throat> school sites and locations um, has the potential of um, being broad and big and deep, um, that, that could uh, potentially um, necessitate more um, more meetings with the team, um, but but I but I'm not 100% sure. Again, it could be the opposite. It could be next Wednesday we come up with these other ideas, and there's an aha moment, and it's crystal clear, and then we're ready to to move and and come to the board and say, okay, this is what the team is saying. This is what they're recommending. What, that's what they're recommending, um, and and we move from there. So I think I mean so Gabriela, I just um, I think for myself, I really want to be able to understand and make sure that our community understands what kind of process timeline we're looking at, because I think we're already starting to get um, people coming to the board, um, questions, um, feeling like decisions are already being made, right? And having having gone through this now twice, right? Yeah. The end of the school year is the worst time of the year to be talking about this and feeling like decisions are being made, right? I think the, the process that the four of us, I mean, Sabrina, you weren't here at that point, the last time where it happened during a school year and it felt like it was paced out. And I'm talking about in terms of like decisions, right? Like that lead to final action by the board. So I just, I feel like the sooner we can be, we can clarify to the community about when decisions are making, are, 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 is this something board's gonna take action on this school year? Is this something that recommendations are gonna come? There's gonna be some public input, action's gonna be taking next year. The sooner we can clarify that timeline, and even if it's not set in stone, the better, because I don't want to have people feeling like they have to put a lot of effort into something when actually decisions are not being made right now, right? Mm -hmm. So I think I, I'm just, and I'm not saying, I'm, I mean, I'm deferring to, I guess, Gabriela Arturo as our president and superintendent, what kind of timeline are we thinking about? So so what I'm hearing I, is, is that right now, for example, there's there's names attached to, to um, right, the, the closure of schools, um, today we heard, you know, 
community members from these schools come out and express their concern. And so what you're saying is, you know, what is the process time? You know, when are we going to make this decision? Because here it says 21, 22, we're looking at this next school year. We're, we're looking at like, we're going to make a decision this June before July. Is, is that correct? Well, yes and no, right? Because this team wants to consider not beginning this I'm sorry, Mr. Ortega, your mic might be off. Thank you, Lika. Um, so not necessarily, uh, because one of the items uh, that this team and the board sub subsequently agreed is that this team needs to have a conversation about, is this starting 21-22 or is this starting 22-23? Now, again, this is, this is not a decision-making team and they know that from, from the get-go, uh, but the, what they're bringing or we're bringing recommendations to the board based on on their input. Um, maybe, and I don't know if this if this kind of satisfies this, um, maybe we give ourselves an internal deadline um, and then we can come to the board uh, just again in full transparency once we kind of get a feel and say, you know, per the board, the board does not want to make a decision in June, just as an example. Uh, which means then that based on how this team is going, um, we can come with a recommendation and say, you know, we're not going to meet this deadline or we're going to move forward. Or the board is, gonna, is saying, no, we need to have something. Then I need, we need to go back to the team and rethink our weekly meetings uh, and the length of our meetings uh, to, 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 to add more ample time to, uh, to have this, this, this decision. Uh, or this think, recommendation, I'm sorry. I think just like um, Shiloni mentioned, you know, actually, th this is a conversation. So I feel that um, it's very premature. You know, these are names. These are not a for sure decision. But the parents at Dalton, you know, have been told that their name's on the list. And so when you say your name's on the list, of course, right, are you going to say what? You know, so this is, I'm sure, why we have them here. We do need more clarification you know, that it's it's just a recommendation and, and the names on the list doesn't mean you're the one. You know, how do we let them know that, that, you know, that's, this is not a guarantee, this is not for sure you. And I think that's why we had so many parents today from Dalton because that's what was told to them. And, you know, I totally understand. I think I would add, there's, there's a degree to which there's, well, Yes, I think that's a fair question. How how can we be how can we be clear? How yeah. can how can we communicate? But but also, there's a degree to which no matter how clear we are, um, there 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 could still exist some confusion because there's a there's a name on a on a slide. Um, and so, I think it's helpful um, what Shilene is asking and, and and suggesting around timeline for process. So so because it's a com yeah it's a conversation. So yeah. if 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 this is looking like action. Is not likely to take place until the the next school school year. That that's helpful, and and then we can we can encourage our, our community to, you know, be involved in the conversation that that's going to be taking place over the course of mm -hmm. months, as opposed to um, necessarily um, exerting energy towards um, a potential that isn't decided on. Mm -hmm. right. I think additionally, um, it's an important distinction, and it's it's hard to kind of hold a container that we can have a decision by X date. And at that date, we can also say, we're going to implement a year out, right? So for example, if we voted, I'm not saying we are, but if we voted on June 15th to adopt a plan, we can also in that, with that action say, and this plan will be implemented as of the following July, July 22, not July 21. So rather than saying, We've made a decision, we're implementing it in 15 days. We're gonna be implementing this decision and implementing the plan a year out. So, so that, that's a good point. Is it, is it helpful or hurtful? I mean, if for us to have a conversation now and, and, est and establish, I mean, to, to, to establish whether um, we, we as a board already deem it um, best to not look at 21-22. Would that be helpful or, or, or harmful for, for the process, uh, do you believe, at this point? Um, in, in terms of, obviously, can't ignore the fact that we're in April, right? Uh, can't ignore the, fa the fact that some of the team members 
uh, have brought up, but um, I don't know. I mean, as a team, uh, I think some people would welcome that and applaud that. And I'm, I'm not sure that the entire team uh, would feel would feel that way. I, I, I don't know. Um, so again, that's a, it's a tough, tough question to, to answer because I, I don't know how, how the entire uh, team feels about. But would that vote that. come from the Board of Education and not the team? I mean, the team, I, I get it. You know, they work very hard. They have recommendations. I totally understand. But I mean, the final decision on the schools, on the timelines, is it up to the Board of Education? thousand percent. So, so j just to speak on board member Rodriguez Pena, um, what I, I'm going to suggest, and I would like to hear my, uh, my team, uh, my team's input on this is, um, since we are not, uh, it's not set in stone that, you know, let's say model, you know, model four, you know, Dalton, Ellen, Ellington and Powell is set in stone that they're the, you know, mm -hmm. um, model three, the same thing, you know, Dalton, Ellington, Lee and Powell. Um, can we switch it up a bit? So that way it's, you know, can we see, I mean, I, I know I'm asking for a lot, but if we can, so that way we can see other scenarios. So, so the way, the way the think? process is set right now. Um, yes. Um, I, I am expecting uh that as we're going through this process with this with the team just like they changed the models uh i i am expecting that 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 this also has the potential to change in terms of the schools that will ultimately come uh to the board of education um as a as a recommendation so so i just want to go back to um to what Adrian said, and it really aligns with what I, what I think where I was leading, and that is, you know, let's just be, let's be upfront, right? So if we think that, be, I mean, to, to know that you guys are meeting on a weekly basis and saying, oh, you may have to accelerate, that's a lot of meetings for our community members on this committee, right? Yes. Um, especially when, I mean, you say we're in April, we're almost in May, right? We're a week away from May, right? So a week and a half away from May. So, I mean, we have to be re realistic about, is this really going to be for an implementation for next year? And if not, let's be clear about it. Let's set reasonable timeline so that we can make a decision. I, I mean, I mean, Sabrina, in terms of like decisions in advance, I'm just going to say just in in from the experience that we had when we first started initiating the conversations to shut down schools and it happened around this time. Right. This is when it sort of the information came out. It felt very rushed. Community felt like they did not know what was happening. Realistically, just logistically, like there was no way that even if we made a decision in that May, in the May when it was first proposed, they, the, the district staff was not going to have enough time to put everything together to, to, to close schools by that September right, or August. So I'm, I'm just saying like, so if that's the case, let's be let's let's yeah. be upfront about it. Right. Let's not have yeah. something on there that's misleading when we know it's not really not possible. It's not very feasible. So what I'm, I'm hearing from the majority of the board is that. Um, and correct me if 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 it, yeah. you know if it's not what I'm hearing is that 2021 you know to start this this next school year 21 22 because mm -hmm. that, that will be the next school year it seems a bit rushed um there is going to be a lot more schools from what you just said um other than just the two schools the movement the you know just the whole <laughs> hustle and bustle of everything and so realistically um, perhaps there needs to be more time. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, I, I, yeah. just to add some nuance and, and, and clarification, though. Um, I want to, I do want to applaud the the, the process, um, especially rec recognizing that we've come to this place because of of, of um, what we've learned from a pre from previous processes. And and last year, one of the things that we talked about when we moved to keep sixth grade at uh, elementary schools is. How how can we um, ha have a more robust plan, and and how can we project out and have some years where we're not making decisions right now that that that's, that's going to be uh, imminently you know implemented you know in in x number of days, weeks, months, um, and so so that's why I'm I'm personally in favor of that of the the idea of let's have let's have a conversation yeah. without the cliff being you know right right in front of us. Let's have a conversation and and, and to, uh, discuss the the different processes. Um, I also though want to recognize that. 
there's a there's an impact to the convert the, the 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 input that comes in while the conversation is happening has an impact on the the the, the product or, or or what is being you know provided to us because originally there was a thought around it being a five year process and one of the suggestions that came in was five years seems too too quick or uh, excuse me five years seems too protracted there's there's no need for it to be that 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 long so what if we expedite the process and I see cabinet saying okay then this is what it would look like if we if we expedite the process so so what we're seeing is a true and authentic response to the input that, that that's coming in and so I I, I want to be careful to say um to not use language to say that it feels rushed because it, it what it feels to me is that that uh cabinet and this team is 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 being responsive is is, is listening and it, and is adapting the, the process based on the the input that that's received and so now i think at this juncture there's additional input that's being provided now from the from the board and so thank you know thank you again for for the the process being flexible enough that there are points throughout where where additional input can be made and and the the, the models can can adapt um, as a result so with that yes I, I I think I would would agree and and suggest that we um, I mean for the lack of better words take take the option of, of implementing anything in 21 22 off the table and so that we we can have a conversation about the the subsequent year I agree I, I think that um uh, we're all in in favor uh, of that, and I I would agree with uh, my fellow board member Greer. I I think you guys have taken this, have not slept. <laughs> yeah. It just it's it's amazing. You know, it's awesome how much you guys have done, and um, just having the flexibility and us having this conversation of being able to say, hey, hold on, you know, let's go ahead and um, turn a little bit to you know to this side. Let's look at this. Um, let's look at the options of, you know, uh, the other schools, you know, kind of shifting them a little bit, looking at, um, you know, giving those, those options. So, so like you said, we, we are not married to, to Dalton, Ellington and Powell B, you know, those schools that like mm -hmm. today we had, um, community members come. And, and so one thing I, I do want to share is, is, is this. the reality of it we we, we are we are going to have to make decisions yeah. and this is not these are not going to be easy decisions i think they did a very good job you know they've been working very hard and i know i, I just feel that um it, it wouldn't be so rushed and i think our decision making it's very important that we really think about what schools you know what funding what programs it's very important that we really think strongly I mean, we're going to make this move. Let's make it right. And, and with that being said, you know, um, one of the things that um, why we're going on this path, I, I think it, it is very important that that we educate our community, right? Time and time, you know, we can say it a hundred million times, but then maybe only two people heard. But I think it's very important that the community understands that our low enrollment. We have people here in Azusa that have children that don't bring their kids to a Susie Unified, right? So our, our people are not having kids like they used to as well, right? The mm -hmm. low birth rate. I mean, all these factors are why we have to do this. And I think about educating the community and, and, and helping them understand. Um, because again, I feel that, you know, the, the Dalton uh, parents and family, you know, came today, they, they, they had very good points. Um, but I just feel it's very premature for them to already feel that it's my school. You know, so we need we need more time and um, to think about this. And it, it's it will happen. And I, I will say, yes, we do need to close some school. It, it's going to happen uh, financially. We see that already. But, um, you know, educate the parents and let them know, you know, why or, you know, how we can help them, uh, you know, when they go to their new school. You know, how, how, what, you know again, um, someone mentioned about, you know, they're going to have a different teacher. Well, that's the same thing happened the last time we made the move. But, you know, we explained your teachers go with you. Your programs go with you when you go to another school. I don't think we've gotten there yet to, to speak to these parents at this time. But these are the things that they need to know so they can feel comfortable when we're making that change. And I'm not saying everything's perfume and flowers, but, you know, 
um, with, with Gladstone Street School and um, Mountain View that changed. I mean, I see they went into Valleydale and Paramount and I mean, they seem to be happy. You know, the programs are there. Their teachers did go with them. These are the things they need to know before you know that, you know, they're thinking, you know, um, we're not having the same teachers and programs. And, and that's, not a, that's not a true statement. Uh, I just want to add, you said uh, programs. Um, can we get some, some information? For example, um, we, we have these models where we have a, a 7 through 12, right? And then we have uh, the, one, the one high school where it's, it's 9 through 12, right? Um, ha have you guys uh, figured out like what programs can be available? So I, I think we, we, you know, what programs can be available for our students if this happens? Um, what are the opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. With sports or um, just the different scenarios? Yeah, so once the team uh, clarifies model three, uh, those are the next steps. The next steps are to go to the team, uh, to to imagine right and to have uh, some ideas of what programs might be uh, again drawbacks uh, possible drawbacks possible benefits support staff and budgetary impact uh, so that that is all part of the process uh, that will come so, so are you saying that they definitely said in model three no you no. you're not saying that that's, no, no, that's no. what i'm hearing i'm no, sorry no, no. That, that's I, what i'm hearing oh, no no i apologize uh, model four is crystal clear. Everybody understands what it is. It's oh, okay. 7, so you're just working on model. Okay. We're just you. trying to get clarity on what, because there were so many moving Got parts. Mm -hmm. We're trying to understand, okay, what is model three going to look like? Mm -hmm. Not the programs and all that right now, but just logistically, what is it going to look like? Um, and so that's, that's our next objective. And then once we get that and we have clarity, then we start moving into the, these other areas, yeah. which include programs. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Absolutely. And, and also in, in staff, you know, I mean, um, I'm just starting out there, but, you know, who's going to lose their jobs? You know, it, it'll happen. You know, I'd, I'd like to know and see how many people are going to lose their jobs through this whole reorganization, you know. Um, programs, you lose programs, you lose people. So we need to know those um, statistics also. Yeah. Before we move on to the next uh, topic, yes, uh, just, just so I'm, I get 100% clarity on this, because I just want to make a, a little nuance. Um, I, I understand uh, completely. I think I, I, we heard uh, implementation in 22, 23. But the, my nuance or my clarity is that we're not suggesting that we're going to pause this work and then start in September again, correct? No, no, okay, no, I just want to be continue. super clear about that, no. that we continue the work. And if that decision comes in September, great. If it comes in October, like whatever that is at that, that time. Okay, thank you, you for that. when you give you more time with your, your team, you know, uh, time. Thank and you your, for that clarity. Just would be to, great. I just want to be crystal they clear on be that. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you again so much for um, we actually are seeing, you know, something concrete and um, our our questions are being answered and in a responsive and prompt way. And we I, I, I truly appreciate that, um, you know, the transparency and the dialogue. And so thank you. Thank you, cabinet for for that. In okay, case so we'll, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next agenda item, which is 9.3, increasing diversity through our hiring practices presentation. Mr. Jorge Ronke. Thank you, Board President. Uh, bear with me as I bring the presentation. Board President Arianes, members of the Board of Education, staff, and community, uh, it is my pleasure to come before you today to discuss this important topic of increasing our diversity through our hiring practices. Uh, the presentation will review uh, 
current research on race and ethnicity as it applies to the teaching practice. I will also review our own data relative to uh, race and ethnicity. And we will review current hiring practices and I will provide um, my some reflection and thoughts on next steps. Um, before we get started on the presentation, I wanna thank the Board of Education for requesting this presentation take place. First, let me start off with uh, California data on diversity, uh, a case for diversity. Uh, and this data comes from Education uh, Trust West. Uh, more than 250,000 students are in schools without a teacher of their same race. Um, I'm happy to report that that is not the case in Azusa. In California, 77% of students um, are students of color and 35% of teachers are teachers of color. Um, and again, I'll show in subsequent slides how that is not the case in Azusa. Uh, going on, more than half of schools don't have a black teacher and one in six schools don't have a Latinx teacher. And more than one in three schools don't have an Asian American teacher. Again, our data in this regard is uh, better than the state average. Uh, more than 78,000 Black students are in schools with no Black teacher. More than 109,000 uh, students um, are in schools with no Latinx uh, teachers. And over 67,000 Asian American or Pacific Islander students are in schools with no Asian American or Pacific Islander teachers. There are some pretty powerful um, data sets. This is an important quote, um, why diversity in our schools matter. It is clear in the research that having uh, Black teachers for Black students or Latinx teachers for Latinx students confers real academic advantages. And this comes from Dr. Myra Lara, also from Education Trust West. Um, and I also want to highlight recent legislation that is making its way through the uh, state legislature. Uh, a recent Department of Education press release highlighted Assembly Bill 520 that is currently working its way through the state legislature. Uh, this bill would establish uh, the California Diversifying Teacher Grant Program awarding $15 million in grants for school districts to provide one-time competitive grants that develop and implement new or expand existing uh, programs that address a local need to develop teachers' uh, workforce while emphasizing the retention of male teachers of color. So I wanna dig a little deeper into the research. According to a report produced by the Greater LA Foundation, educators of color can have a range of positive effects on students of all races and ethnicities, especially students of color. Uh, the report cites these academic advantages. Schools with greater number of black teachers have greater representation of black students in gifted education programs and advanced courses. The same holds true for Latinx teachers and students. Exposure to just one black teacher in elementary schools significantly reduces high school dropout rate amongst black boys. And more Latinx teachers in math and science in middle school and high school increases the likelihood of Latinx students taking STEM in classes in college. I wanted to highlight our own data of um, on diversity, uh, the two uh, pie charts before you are um, is our uh, data um, as of um, a month ago, uh, and it's uh, of our from our teachers, um, the largest block um, at fifty three percent is Hispanic, um, and then our next uh, highest uh, uh, percentile um, of ethnicity is white at 39%. Um, and then on the student side, um, our students are at 92.1% Hispanic. So moving on to the recommendations from the research. 
uh, first incentivize uh, entrance into teaching. Uh, and this could start as early as high school. Um, the research uh, provided examples of programs uh, that started outreach programs for high school students uh, to start thinking and planning for a career in education. Um, also support innovative and supportive teacher prep programs like para paraprofessionals to teacher programs. Uh, this requires districts to cultivate partnerships with higher education institutions. I'll talk a little bit later how we have been working in this area and how we uh, could continue to deepen our, our partnerships in this particular era, area. And then districts should develop and cultivate uh, partnerships with local colleges and universities to increase diversity of teaching applicants. Um, again, I will show a little bit later the number of, of uh, uh, partnerships that we currently have, um, and then I'll share my reflections as to where we could, again, continue to, to improve where we're currently at. And then include job posting and descriptions that contain language that welcome all individuals regardless of background. And I will explain what we're doing in this area. I also wanted to uh, uh, pay a little attention to, um, some important attention to the uh, supporting and retaining of new teachers. Um, national studies indicate that once educators of color are in classrooms, they tend to change schools or leave the profession at higher rates than their white peers. This creates a cycle of hiring less experienced teachers that can ultimately have an effect on student outcomes and achievement. And on the right of this uh, slide, it shows, um, again, this is national uh, research, how uh, districts serving more students from low-income families have higher turnover rates among teachers, and then it creates the cycle that I just described. I want to uh, change the focus uh, now towards our current partnerships. Uh, the district is currently partnering with 21 teacher preparation programs at colleges and universities. Uh, these partnerships provide uh, preparation to obtain um, uh, student teaching experience. Uh, these partnerships are valuable for the teacher candidates themselves um, and the district because it allows prospective teachers to uh, work to gain firsthand experience working in our schools and alongside some uh, alongside our outstanding teachers. Additionally, when it comes to hiring, uh, we often see that the candidates that are applying to our positions are coming from the pool of teachers that have participated in our student teaching program. Below um, is a is data that depicts the number of current teachers that participate in our current LACO induction program. Uh, induction serves two uh, objectives. First, uh, induction is a systemic approach or support for uh, new teachers. This uh, support is provided through trained support providers that meet with new teachers on a regular basis and um, provide them uh, formative feedback and also provide uh, uh, act as a sounding board for new teachers who are experiencing the profession for the first time and um, they get a um, non-objective voice to be able just to bounce ideas from. The second objective is to um, help our newest teachers clear their credential uh, so that they are, um, they, they satisfy the CTC's requirement for credentialing. Uh, we currently have 16 teachers participating in this uh, program. Uh, so it shows you that we don't have a lot of new teachers that are entering the profession for the first time. Um, that 16 teacher represents 4% of our entire teaching staff. I wanna highlight our, our current uh, practices around hiring for certificated. Um, the application process uh, starts with the position being posted uh, on EdJoin, and it's usually posted for two weeks. Um, my office screens for uh, appropriate credentials uh, to make sure that the uh, person who we're moving on to the sites to um, 
uh, start interviewing, have at the very minimum the correct credentials. Uh, and then the sites um, are asked to identify the candidates that they want to interview, the sites interview, and then reference calls are made. Um, uh, and that's done in collaboration with me for, for teachers. And then my office conducts the second interview, okay, where I sit with the uh, teacher uh, and 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 uh, start the the interview and, and have a second interview with the with the candidate. For classified, uh, the position is also posted on EdJoin. Uh, we also I uh, post it on our AUSD website and we post it at sites um, as well. The HR office screens for appropriate qualifications. Um, and then the HR identifies candidates to interview. And then HR, in accordance to our collective bargaining agreement with CSCA, uh, holds their first round of interviews uh, with uh, site administrators and other uh, you know, members who participate. And then the site holds the second round interviews. Reference calls are made again, and then the site recommends the chosen candidate and then it's moved on to the Board of Education. I wanna spend some time talking about the reflections that this uh, developing this uh, presentation has allowed me to uh, think about and uh, start implementing. Uh, the first uh, starts off with uh, establishing uh, for our, uh, even our middle schools and our high schools, um, student groups that promote and encourage students to pursue a career in teaching. Um, really um, making that something that is a, a tangible, um, real um, experience for, for our students. Uh, wouldn't it be nice, wouldn't it be great for our own students uh, to, to be our teachers? And we're seeing lots and lots of those examples, but if we're able to, to, to grow that capacity, that'll just be phenomenal. Um, like I mentioned early, deepen our partnerships with local colleges and universities to grow our application pool. We're already in the process of, of doing um, a lot of this work. Um, we are exploring a possible partnership with uh, APU uh, on a teacher residency program to help us, uh, help us with hard to fill teaching positions like in special education. A teacher residency program integrates coursework with actual classroom practice for a one-year uh, residency program. Um, it is something that um, we are, we are act actively uh, looking into. Uh, we are in the process of uh, do, conducting an internal HR audit of our application process, um, where we're looking uh, to ensure that our process is equitable, and we eliminate bias. We're doing this by examining our job postings. We are looking at our practices around screening. We are taking a deep look into the questions that we ask um, our, our candidates at all phases of the interview process. I will share that some of this work has already started and we've already taken some steps to um, make some of these changes. Um, and that is reflected in the questions that uh, we ask uh, in the second round of teachers uh, and management uh, candidates. Uh, in, the, in the final uh, round, we've curated questions um, that highlight our district's priorities, uh, questions that focus on collaboration, questions that focus on continuous improvement and reflective practices. One of our questions, and whenever I ask this question, I get a very distinct response from the candidates as they hear the question. And the question reads, uh, we are working on confronting systemic racism in Azusa. How will you build positive relationships with staff and community? Also in our new uh, employee orientation presentations, we are articulating how we embrace diversity. Uh, recently uh, in a message to um, all staff, our superintendent, Mr. Ortega, stated the following. Uh, we are all committed to respect, equity, and justice. And this is what uh, Ms. Davis mentioned in her comments today. We believe in uh, teaching and modeling our students the responsibility of ev 
the responsibility of every member of our society to treat all people with love and respect for our shared humanity and a deep appreciation for the diversity that enriches us. Going forward, we will be intentional in our communication to our newest employees uh, by clearly stating that we are all committed to respect, equity, and justice. So the continued work is, um, and in closing, I, I wanna state that we are just beginning this, this real uh, heavy process of looking at our HR practices through a equity, diversity, and inclusion lens. In preparation for this presentation, um, I participated in a virtual workshop uh, led by LACO on the topic of equity, diversity, and inclusion with a specific focus on hiring and retaining employees. I, in addition to the aforementioned changes, uh, we will continue to explore partnering with uh, university teacher residency programs and also explore how we could uh, build uh, opportunities for our classified employees to pursue careers in the teaching profession. And with that, I will close and um, welcome your questions uh, or discussion. Let's go ahead and start. Yolanda. Uh, I was gonna, oh, yes, I, I was going to ask regarding the um, the teachers, uh, what colleges are we partnering, or uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, how many college, colleges are we partnering with that have teachers come train, and I, I don't think the word's the right, train, uh, here this is unified. We have several colleges, correct, like we Mount Sac and... 20, not Mount Sac, but we have 21 colleges. 21, yeah. 21 yeah. colleges. Um, and I'm sorry, what, what do you call it's not training? They're, they're the teacher preparation programams. And oh, it's, okay. I, I mean, and I, and I should really say teacher or professional uh, programs because we have some for psychologists, we have some for speech and language therapists, um, counselors. Oh, okay. uh, so it's not just teaching. But it's not only for being a teacher. It's not only for being oh, a teacher. Okay. Um, and are we have a, do we have a, a shortage of, of teachers at this time? I'm sorry. Uh, do we have a, short, a shortage of teachers? The state is projecting a shortage of teachers, um, and the, we're 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 seeing a shortage of teachers in areas like special education, math, um, science, uh, mm. some of the STEM, uh, and uh, as as I mentioned, some research clearly pointed just how beneficial um, those it could be for students uh, students of color to see students that represent them that are that they could relate to teaching those classes. You know, it's, it's great that, that uh, Azusa Unified School District has hired many uh, teachers that are born and raised in Azusa. They know the community, the students, you know, it, they connect and they have gone to the schools here at AUSD. I, I don't know how many teachers there are, but I know there's several, many, and I think that's really great. And, and also they become administrators. Mm -hmm. We have many principals mm -hmm. that went to Azusa Grafton High School centers, lost and what have you. But I think that's really great that you we're hiring within our community. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Can, uh, thank you for, um, um, this is, I'm grateful that we're taking time to review this, that, that your, your team is looking, you know, looking at the, the questions and applications to, to consider bias and, and, and just going through with the fine tooth comb. I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, this is this is really interesting to me on on slide seven, uh, where it says supporting and retaining new teachers. Um, maybe can can you put that slide up there? Thank you. So this this statement here on the left it says um, national studies indicate that once educators of color are in the classroom, they tend to change schools or leave the profession at higher rates than their white peers. Um, this to me sounds like like something. I, I'm I'm curious to know you know what's maybe behind this. I don't know if the yeah. article that this is referencing is is readily available and or can be forwarded to us. Yeah. I, I'd be interested in knowing Absolutely. more about what this is uh, describing. And then once if we were to look at that and understand what why that happens, what are what are things that we can do here within the the district since we recognize that this is something that that happens. Excellent question. I will say that California is ahead of the curve when it comes to um, its induction program and its intentional step that they take to support new teachers. Um, it used to be when I started teaching that 
a new teacher would clear their credential with additional college coursework. Uh, now, in order to clear your credential, which when you, when you get your teaching credential, you, you receive a preliminary teaching credential, and then you have to go through induction, which is a uh, very intentional support mechanism to do two things, provide that support, non-evaluative support, formative feedback to teachers, and then throughout that process or through that process, the teacher clears their credential and then they, they, they're satisfying the commission on teacher credentialing requirement. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we should always be looking to see how we are supporting our new teachers. One of, one of, one of the uh, points that we have here in Azusa is we have uh, professional learning communities throughout the organization. And what you see in situations, as is reflected on this slide, is where teachers have high levels of isolation, uh, do not have anybody to go to. Um, and we have built-in support system through our professional learning communities, wherein a teacher, um, I'll be how new they are, uh, can, could get that support from their colleagues and then really get that, that, that learning through, through practice and, and experience educators. No, it, thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I wonder if there's more to, with this in mind, if there's, if there's, if this can direct our, uh, our, our eyes to investigate and look into some additional yeah. things within our district, you know, specifically. And, and I would, I would uh, just uh, look forward to seeing what AB uh, 520, uh, because what they're really specifically looking at is not just the hiring, but the retain, retention of, of teachers of color um, once they enter the, once they enter the profession. Um, Mr. Ronquillo, do, do we already have data around our own teacher retention rate? I know that in a lot of the public comment, we have teachers of 20 years, 30 years participating. Um, do, do we keep that kind of data or is it possible to, to run that kind of data about our own year-to-year -year retention rate? Absolutely, yeah. I, I, that, that data exists. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't have it on a report to, to be able to share with the board in our next board update, but I could commit to providing that to the board. Thank you. I, um, I actually have a question uh, going back to your slides and, you know, reading, reading the, um, the quote that, you know, it is clear in the research that having black teachers for black students or Latin X teachers for Latin X students confers real academic advantages. Um, I agree with that. What, what I don't see here, um, and this is like sensitive, right? Um, LGBTQ. Um, so how, how, how do we approach that, right? Um, some teachers, yeah. you know, do we have teachers that, that, that are for those group of students? I mean, I, I don't know. You, you can present, so. Um, and that's, a, that's an area for further study. Um, okay. And I could um, bring it up to the uh, group that I am interacting with at LACO on. Um, uh, so I, I'll, we'll see what, what, we're, what, what the thought is around that and how to best approach that. Great. Thank you so much for, for doing that. I, I, you know, please get back to us on because um, I would like to um, have that included here in our district as well. You know, be accepting of, of all, um, including our LGBTQ community. And thank you for your presentation. Thank I, you. I, I think we're moving in the right direction and um, having conversations and that that's what it's all about. <clears throat> now moving on to our agenda item, consent calendar. Can I please get a motion to move 10.1 uh, through 10.9? So moved. Second. Second. We have board member Greer uh, on first motion. We have a second by board member Cruz Gonzalez. Do we have any questions, comments, concerns? 
seeing that there's none, let's go ahead and. This, uh, uh, yes, point, sir. point of order, this, this is with the exclusion of 10.2? I'm sorry, yes, sir. Yeah, with the exclusion of 10.2, as stated in, at the beginning of our meeting, yes, sir. And we can please cast our vote. Thank you. Great, thank you. It passes 5-0. We'll skip 11.0. No items were pulled from consent calendar at this point for this agenda. We'll move on to business and finance. 12.1, ratification, approval of the Executive Environmental Consulting Services Agreement between Azusa Unified School District, AUSD, for asbestos inspection. Can I please get a motion to move 12.1? I make a motion to approve 12.1. Thank you. We have a first by board member Rodriguez Pena, and we have a second by board member Cruz Gonzalez. Do we have any questions or comments? Seeing that there's none, then we can go ahead and please vote. We have a 5-0. Moving on to 12.2, we have ratification, approval of consultant, Gina R. murphy Garrett, resolution number 20-2129. Can I please get a motion to move 12.2? So moved. Second. And so we have a first by board member Greer, and we have a second by board member Rodriguez-Pena. Do we have any discussion, comments? I'd like to, I'd just like to know on the uh, hiring process where we're at on this position and, and how long are we kind of on keeping this um, person? Yes, yeah, so we currently, the uh, job was flown on Friday um, and we were flying it open to field. So that way, as we're getting qualified candidates, we can do the interview process. And then a consultant will be here until we have the vacancy filled. Thank you. Great. Seeing that there's no, no more questions, let's please take our vote. And we have a 5-0. Moving on to 12.3, approval of lease agreement between the Azusa Unified School District and East San Gabriel Valley Regional Occupation Program, ROP. Can I please get a motion to move 12.3? Can I make a motion to approve? We have a first by board member Cruz Gonzalez. Second. We have a second by board member Rodriguez Pena. <clears throat> Do we have discussion, comments? Yes. I yes. want to ask, oh, I'm sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. I, I didn't see you. Go ahead. Um, yes, I, I have several questions about the, the proposed lease agreement. Um, I'll, I'll start with a, a basic question. Is there a, a, was there supposed to be a site plan attached to the agreement? Okay. Um, and in my, my reading of, of the agreement, um, I know we're, this is a, you know, the East San Gabriel Valley ROP is a, a we consider them a trusted partner. We work with them. Um, it would seem that bringing um, them to one of our sites that's not currently occupied, um, you know, brings a program that we're already participating in. It, 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 it boosts the, the programmatic, programmatic offerings of the district. And it also is a revenue source. So I, I think it meets all of those um, strategic goals. So proven partner, trusted partner, revenue stream. Um, is there a, you know, especially when we're talking about money, even among trusted partners, I didn't see in the document um, a due date for lease payments. Is that contemplated to be monthly or annually? Yes. So the, uh, it, it was not in there. Well, actually, the second paragraph did outline the mm -hmm. lease amount, and it said it'll be paid on the uh, first subsequent month after board approval, unless I overlooked that. But that's the draft attached A. Is that the one you're talking about? No, in the actual body of the lease agreement. But the lease terms identify that the ter uh, payments will be paid uh, monthly um, based on the amount of square footage that'll be utilized. 
is it possible to bring that up on the screen or tell us what page it is or what article? This one right here. Oh, it's, the attachment? It, uh -huh, a draft attachment A. Is that one you're talking about? Yes, please. I think that's the one. So you would like to see where, where, where it says that. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Oh, no. Um, yes, if you could keep scrolling right here. The lease sale commence on May 1st. Um, it does not specify exactly the date the payments are coming, but the we were taking that as the first payment will be due May 1st when they occupy the facility after board approval. Okay, and then if um, maybe it, I haven't had enough coffee or maybe it's late, but when I count the number of the lease term, I count three years and two months if it's contemplated that it begins on May 1st. Is that something that has changed or from what's yes. presented here? Yes, ma'am. So this is an oversight on both sides. So originally they wanted to occupy the facility in April. And then when we had to go back and read change the terms because they want to decrease the lease, that's when we changed it to May 1st. So if it's changed just to kind of, um, shouldn't it also change as well to, to, for it to be concise with, with the dates? Yes, and we could change the, uh, the three to two. Um, this is to get approval of the lease so that they could take it to their board to approve. So we can modify the two to, um, to reflect two months on the actual document. So should we um, not vote on it until it's it's changed? It, you know, I we don't can, want we can to vote, vote on, on something that's not. Um, we with can the make those kind of minor changes right now and just clarify that it's two months, not three months, as we as we take action. And what I'm hearing as well is um, that uh, we would like to go ahead and have on on this lease agreement um, a date on when we expect the payment. Is, is that what I'm hearing? Uh, ab absolutely. Um, I, I have a few more substantive questions, but I don't want to take up all the air. Um, so I, I do want to open it up to the rest of the board for their own questions so that we can maybe kind of bounce off of each other. Uh, I have just one question. Um, can, can you, could you clarify um, the, the cancellation and term, ter, termination, I mean, the, the hypothetical scenarios, I, I, it's, an, it's Article 7, and it's referenced a couple of times where, where it says uh, that uh, the termination can be terminated, you know, herein, but, I, but I'm not sure that I see reasoning and or just justification or, or what, what are justified um, reasons just for understanding and clarity. So our, our thought process, um, working collaboratively with them, is that it will be a mutually agreed upon uh, decision. Um, they wanted a long release. Um, we held fast on the years that we offered. Um, they were looking at a five year, and this was their way of ensuring that we wouldn't just have powers. We just say, nope, we just want to cancel the lease. So are you saying um, it's mutually agreed upon? So, so, so the, the, the district, therefore, with this lease, does not have recourse in the event of, of a desire to uh, um, and terminate the lease earlier than yes sir and i i have a few questions i have two uh, three actually well first um so what what will the district be responsible for for example um you know uh maintaining of of the site um lights water trash what does that look like? And so we agreed to uh, maintain the grounds um, so that we can um, maintain our curb appeal. Um, but the facility, we will maintain our electricity based on our usage. So we will be dividing, we'll be looking at the meter for both utility and water, and they will pay they, their fair share for both water and power. And they are handling their own technology, um, but they do have the option to contract out with us to utilize our services, as well as if, if there's items that need broken, fix it since they don't have their own maintenance team as well, but they will have their own custodial team. And what, um, what projection of revenue are we expecting for, for the district with, with this lease? So right now, based on the current square footage, I believe it's about 78,000. Originally we did project out 100,000, 
a uh, little over 113,000, but they have decreased the amount of square footage that they would need to utilize at this time. So, so we're, we're, we're leasing it on square footage. Is, is that what I'm hearing? Correct. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I have a couple of follow-up questions, one to board member Greer and one to President Arianis. Um, regarding uh, Article 7 cancellation and termination, um, I, I don't see that we have to come together and agree on a termination. Um, I'm reading the first sentence, district may terminate this lease by giving the ROP written notice of termination at least six months prior to the date, period. I, I don't see where it says that we would need to mutually agree. I, to me, that reads that we can unilaterally terminate as long as we honor the six months notice. And that is true. But what I'm saying is we're working in collaboration to agree that since they wanted more time that we will mutually have a mutual discussion with them before we just terminate that. So even though we have the six month pause, so that's not part, that's not actually in the lease? No, no, ma'am. The only thing we would have to abide by is the six months. Okay. Um, tagging on to uh, board president's question around the revenue. Um, can, you, can you give us more detail around how we got to 75 cents per square foot? Yes. Um, and and my, my thinking around that is in looking at um, industrial commercial leases in Azusa, they're more at, a dollar a square foot. So can you tell us about how the, the, the price per square foot was negotiated? Yes, so we had a previous board meeting where we outlined and I um, had a presentation where we showed exactly what the average square foot was going for at the time. And we identified what we can, um, what we would earn as far as revenue based on the square footage they were um, requesting. Um, I identified and shared what their current square footage lease was. And at that time, the board took action and agreed to the 75 cents per square foot. And for my edification, how long ago was that? I want to, if I can't guess, I want to say October-ish this year, but it was this fiscal year. Okay. Okay. Um, I want, okay. And I just want to ask a question regarding um, the, what we, you know, um, the same questions that President Ariana said, but also the, the custodial, I see this is a district was solemnly responsible for groundskeeping. So what about the custodial use where, you know, you're emptying the trash cans, you're, um, vacuuming the floor or well because PPE we need all that who is doing that they have their own custodial team they have they their own don't custodial have their own grounds oh okay because I don't see it here I'm, I just see the ground keeping because I know we need to keep it looking nice you know our di our district um groundsmen but um it's not on here that they will they will have their own custodian so the intent was to identify the areas that we're responsible for but um going forward we can make sure we're updating our leases to identify both sides Okay, and I had the same question to the utility, but I, I understand. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Mm -hmm, no problem. I, I do have a couple more yes. questions, if that's okay. Um, uh, Ms. Jamal, something that stands out to me is the um, that this lease proposed lease agreement seems to be very um, tenant friendly in that um, we're giving the proposed tenant the ability to make tenant improvements. Um, and there's no opportunity for the district to have any approval or oversight of those improvements. Um, it seems to me that that could put the district at risk if the tenant were to make improvements that were um, not compliant or um, you know, if they knocked out a, a load bearing wall. Um, and in the instance where we would have maybe multiple tenants because they're occupying a part of the property. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering about um, our role as a, a district to be able to um, authorize and approve proposed tenant improvements. Um, that is not identified. We did not have the discussion, but that is something that we can look into going forward when we have lease agreements to identify it to make sure it's spelled out. So, so when when can we see and just to um, the, these things added to to the lease that we're speaking of? So, um, with board approval, we can um, I can take the recommendations, modify the lease, send it back to the ROP uh, entity so that they can have a board approved. Or another option is we could table it. Um, I can make the amendments, send it back for their first approval and bring it back. That would just uh, delay the uh, occupancy of starting in May 1st. Which is? All right, so are you comfortable? So so Sabrina, if we, if, if we take action with the recommendation that you have, are we comfortable just allowing 
Latasha to, to write the language aligned with what the intent that you just laid out in terms of us, us get, um, having approval over any tenant improvements? Uh, frankly speaking, no. No? Okay. I, I, I think that this document um, doesn't afford the district enough protections. Um, and again, I, I understand where we want to go with this trusted partner. Programmatically, it's a boost. It's a revenue stream that's not currently happening. I deeply understand that. But I'm coming from a perspective of risk management and risk mitigation for the district. So that, um, you know, many of these things are not uh, huge in and of themselves. But I think when there's ambiguity in several of the clauses, um, down the road, you know, a year from now or 18 months from now, when something happens and it's not clearly defined in the document, that's going to put both parties at risk, or it could put both parties at risk, and it will involve a lot of, you know, human power and, and, and uh, legal resources. So I would prefer to do a little more work on the document and then bring it back to the full board, uh, bring a new document back to the board um, for our for our review and possible approval. That, so, that's what I would be comfortable with. So, so I have a question actually, um, you know, to, to, to that, but for, for Latasha, um, what is um, the need for it to be made first? Just, just, you know, so is there, you know, for them to get their programs ready? I mean, is there an explanation for it, you know, has to be made first? So they're just, currently having to move out of their current location. And so originally their desire was to move in in April, um, but then um, they had a change in staffing and they wanted to uh, uh, decrease the number of square footage, which is why we had to table the item last for last board meeting. And so this is the um, last scheduled board meeting that we would have before their board would take action to actually make the lease enacted. So so I, I hear what you're, you're saying, um, but, and I hear what you're saying, um, but, but I think it's really important um, that that we vote on something that, that is clear. Um, mm. But at the same time, I mean, if we pass it today, let's just say with the exception to make amendments, if they're okay with it, right? We, we're literally gonna be changing certain things on there, right? Just to get, you know, to, to kind of help them out. I mean, it kind of, Yes, so, so, so why, why can't we table the item until we right, that's what I'm saying. it's 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 messy so i think it's so it, it, i think it, it just gets real messy so i'm i'm gonna have to yes um wait sorry just so you i'm not sure what you're su you're suggesting that we, that we table it no. you're suggesting we vote on it to, to, tonight as or, or with suggested amendments you know, so what i'm saying if we were to vote on it tonight Right. So just just like when you lease an apartment, and so forth. When you enter into agreement, right? Once you enter into the agreement, it's it's like so. If we were to go ahead, so basically, if we were to vote on, so I'm giving the example. If we were to go vote on it tonight, and then try to go make changes. I how how would that look? So could, so I could could I could I recommend? So here I'm 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 hearing that that there's we're, we're in a bit of a pickle in that the 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 lease is is we're hoping for that to start on may 1st but the document is not quite you know where we would prefer it to be can i can i recommend and suggest if or or would the board be comfortable if there was a subset of of uh, a couple of board members here that were willing to hear the sentiment and then be in on the uh, on, on the, the conversation to ensure that the document is up to Part I would recommend sub, sub, you, uh, Board Member Bo, being on that that subcommittee if, if if you're comfortable, and would that then allow us to be a bit more nimble in in uh, producing a docu document with with board approval that that can be in uh, and allow for for a May first start. Can, can I suggest something uh, different? Sure. So that way we're not trying to do another subcommittee. How how about you know how long would it take for you to go ahead and um, make these changes? Us have an emergency meeting for five, 10 minutes and getting this approved. I mean, so that way we don't have to, you know, it, it, it just sounds a lot more clear. Um, I don't know, what do you guys think? So a special meeting? Right, just a special meeting so we can go ahead and get this approved and be able to, how fast can you turn this around for us to be able to vote on it and be comfortable enough for us to be able to move forward? So what? 
I, I have no problem with committing to jump in on this first thing in the morning. I just don't know if this will constitute a special board meeting, but I would have to defer. So little, here's another, I mean, I just again, as we're says. talking about um, options, another option is to, um, because this we do this with other stuff, it happens, um, is we, we take action and the action is, um, I make a motion to approve um, item, uh, twelve point three with the following with the following changes, that can then go to their board for approval, and then at May fourth, we bring back the contract, uh, the amended contract for approval. Board hat. How how does that work in terms of the lease being fully executed and the tenant moving in? How does it work? Right. Because if we, we come back on the fourth to ratify or to approve the contract. Are, are we, are we moving a, a, a move-in date? Or? No, it would have the May 1st date. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, the understanding is that that contract is going to have the things that we are highlighting tonight. Right, but then th there's three days of, uh, right? It, that's what you're saying. There's three days of technically them not moving in. I mean, that would be, it could be prorated. And I mean, it all, pro all things are possible. Right, so. Or it could be May 5th. So changing that on, I mean, that would still be prorated. It, so prorated what I'm rate. hearing, so what I'm hearing from everyone is, is possible solutions, but Latasha, you just shared right now, Ms. Latasha Jamal, that you can get on this tomorrow. Um, go ahead and make those changes, uh, to, you know, for the suggestions that uh, we as a board have um, brought up and want, would like to have this included in um, this lease agreement. So that way in turn, they can turn around and take it to their board um, by their next meeting. And so the majority here said that they, they would be okay to, to, to meet, to go ahead and, and, and have this, no? Well, we wouldn't be able to meet before the next ROP meeting because they're meeting on Thursday. That, right, um, so, she, so we're talking about tomorrow. But we can't have said, a board meeting. We can't have a special, we, we, we can't have an emergency board meeting on this and special meeting requires 24 hour notice. Got it. So um, I didn't know when the ROP board meeting was. So, it's it's on Thursday. Thursday. so, so I, I mean, I say I'm going to just throw out another suggestion. Right. I think I think um, we should do what Arturo said and we can we should be the final executor of the document. But I think in order to if we want to facilitate and have ROP vote on it Thursday. Right. Let's do what Adrian suggested. And if Latasha can update the language and two of us review it tomorrow to make sure the language is is reflects what this board the direction the board's given right then that can go to the rop meeting and then that can come back to us in may and we would be the final like so they wouldn't move in until after they'd have to move in may 5th yeah. they we wouldn't we wouldn't we wouldn't do i mean i'm okay with ratification like letting them move in may 1st but if the rest of you are not then it would have to be may may 5th the only concern would be like would they ask for a pro rate or would they be okay just to keep it may 1st well, it's just, it's five days, well, five days off. So it's yeah not huge. It's not a um, Does our, so thinking about the other, you know, our partner, um, does the ROP have the ability to call a special meeting for next week so that we're not trying to do this revision in 24 hours to satisfy ROP's board meeting deadline? And I don't know. I don't know their ability to add or remove what we need. So, so, so what I'm hearing is, um, we, 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 as a board, would like these um, amendments added. Um, we had a suggestion from uh, two of our board members, and I, I, I would have to agree with with that. Um, having a, a special ad hoc committee to look over the amendments, and for us to go ahead and vote on it tonight. And um, go ahead tomorrow. Uh, Latasha will go ahead and have that. Um, Latasha, do you have a time frame at, uh, after two, after four, um, where we can? I don't have that level. No worries. Of, uh, okay. Number. But if I can um, just get clarity on the amendments as requested. Yes. Um, let, let, let me just real quick. And so then we will vote on tonight, ad hoc committee tomorrow, present it to the ROP board on Thursday. Um, the only uh, clarification that we need is would we prorate or leave it at May 1st? 
I think we can defer that to the staff to figure out. Okay, you guys figure. So, um, other than that, then uh, added the amendments and the board approves it with the amendments being. Um, and so the amendments that I have uh, are, and correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, are the, uh, the proposed tenant improvements, right? Clarification that the on that. The district would need to approve any and all tenant improvements. Mm -hmm. And um, the next one? Um, I, I didn't say this yet, but Article 7 references ROP subtenants in line one, two, three, four, five. Um, I don't see any, the, the, our, the lease is silent on subtenants and I, I would um, I would suggest that we prohibit subletting, right? Our, our tenant is our post tenant is ROP, not any of their subtenants. So the um, challenge, um, I would encourage that we just identify language to cover that uh, because ROP services is partnering with others to provide the service in a program. As tenants? It's not as a tenant, but I think they, let's say if I was doing a banking class, I would have Bank of America to come in and occupy that classroom to teach that course. So for example, they partner with, um, what's that called, Pacific Oaks College, right? To come in and provide classes. In the past, ROP has done that. So I understand that. I understand that in terms of a programmatic partnership, but right. that, that's, I'm not understanding that that's the same as a subtenancy. Yeah, and it, I don't think it, I don't think it is. No, to Bank of America or Pacific Oaks. So, right? so can we re reward that? Is is that what you're asking? Um, I, I would like it to be clear that we would prohibit set subtenancy or subletting. Yes, ma'am. And just uh, for clarification, it would be just the partners, right? So, um, not include anything. Just remove the subtenants. Is that is that what you're right? I mean, the the, the partners that are coming in to offer the the programs are they they're not being charged to lease the space right they're just coming in to teach the class is that how it would work or is that not how it does work on their current site i could not speak to that that would be an rop question and i don't know so i okay I mean, but, like but i think i think you're probably teacher. right Sabrina. i think you're probably right that it's not yeah, they they probably get it. They're not leasing the grant, space. which they'd be able to go ahead and carry yeah. out the class. Yeah. yeah, right. So they wouldn't be a subtenant. Yeah. So I'm. Oh. So I'm. Um, I, I just want to make sure that we're protected, um, and that it's also clear because it does say subtenant here, but it's not addressed anywhere else. Um, so those are two things, right? Do we have one, two? I also have the three months to two months. That's right. I also have the uh, the payment uh, the payment uh, due dates. Payment due dates. That's right. And kind of taking a step back, um, I know in, in Article Two Option or Two C, it talks about ROP option to lease um, additional spaces. Um, so they have the option. Is is would the ROP have the exclusive exclusive or right of first refusal option on that space. So for example, if we enter into this lease agreement and then another community partner wants to come in and take suite B, would they be, would we be allowed to do that or do we need to offer it first to ROP? Okay. Since the contract only says the, the square foot, is that yes, correct? That's why, okay. Well, and I mean, it just says they, they, they may, at least the additional identified spaces, but they're not required to, and we could also lease it out to someone else. Correct. And the main means that they have the ability to say, hey, you know, we're going to add another classroom. Is this classroom available? And we'll go through the exact same process. We'll walk over the square footage, we'll marriage measure it, and then we'll come back to the board to identify the increase in square footage. Mm -hmm. so we have a total of four. Yes. Four amendments. So as we're moving forward, um, the majority has decided we can go ahead and um, we, we will go ahead and vote on this today. So can I offer just for additional clarity, um, yes. if we're going to, are, are we saying just make those changes and not have a, not have it reviewed by a, a, no, a no, subset of it? And then, we'll, uh, yeah. I, and, and then okay, go ahead. So I, I need uh, two board members that are available tomorrow um, that would like to be part of the subcommittee to read through this. And um, just as, um, and I'm so sorry, a board member had suggested since Sabrina 
uh, would you be okay to be on this ad hoc? So can we can you clarify what the motion is on the table that we're voting on? So, so yes. So what I am proposing at this point right now, I, I need a motion for 12.3 approval of lease agreement between the Azusa Unified School District and East San Gabriel Valley Regional Occupations with the amendment of the proposed tenant improvements, the subtenant um, section to go ahead and include that it's a 3.2, that it reflect on the dates and the payment due added. Upon review by the upon review, Yes, uh, upon review by an ad hoc committee tomorrow when Latasha reaches out to, to the committee um, and they would uh, have to re re return it back to her. Um, so, so we just needed a time actually a projected time. I will uh, work hard to see if we can get this done by two o'clock um, because I do have to afford them enough time to review it to assure that they agree because it could be that whatever we change, they may say never mind as well. Does the ROP they have ROP. to post? Do they have a Brown Act yes, provision for posting? So is it already exceeded then? It, you didn't, they're not required to post the actual lease. Mm -hmm. They have the item posted and they could post their attachments or present them during the board meeting. So again, just, just for clarification, before I move forward with, with motioning and, and being able to carry this forth, I, I'm gonna ask, ask our board um, who would like to be in this ad hoc committee for tomorrow um, by two o'clock, be able to uh, read this and be able to, I would say, um, would you say five o'clock for them to return it back to you or four third, give them two and a half hours. Does that seem feasible? Ample time. Okay. I, I can do it. I mean, it's okay. Great. Are you, you're going to be yes. on the screen? Yeah, I can, I can be the other person. Okay, so I have, I have a little break. I can read that. Board member Bo. Okay, now I can go ahead and motion with all of this that we have now. I now will go ahead and motion the, the, with everything. Can I please get a motion to move 2.3 approval of lease agreement between the Azusa Unified School District and East San Gabriel Valley Regional Occupation with all the amendments and the ad hoc with the times discussed move this forward so we have a first by board member greer i'll second and we have a second by board member cruz gonzalez if we can please finalize our vote The shared screen is not there, but what I can see right now, it is a five zero. So five um, zero is what it is. Don't know what happened to the screen. Oh, there it is. Great. Thank you. Thank you guys for taking the time um, and, and pulling this through and working it out. Now, moving on, on uh, our agenda for today, we'll move into curriculum and instruction. 13.1 Summer Programming 2021 Frank Chang. Good evening, Board President Arellanes, uh, members of the board, Superintendent Ortega, uh, members of cabinet, staff, and the Azusa Unified community. I am pleased to have the opportunity to present regarding our Summer of Extravaganza programs. Our partnership with Think Together and Citrus College will offer a variety of learning experiences for our students for the summer of 2021. With me in the presentation, if um, applicable, will be principal of Glassstone High School, Gabriel Fernandez, as well as um, director of special education, Aaron Kramer. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and present uh, my screen, which will be um, the slides that were in the attachment with the agenda. Hopefully you see the screen right now and the title page, which is Azusa Unified, uh, Think Together, Citrus College and Summer Extravaganza. 
Um, so we have a very enriching opportunity uh, for our students in partnership with Think Together. You see the dates before you. We will be running three full sessions, 12 days each, um, starting in, on June 14th, running all the way through August 3rd. Um, this was a um, conscious decision to ensure that our students would be able to have learning opportunities throughout the summer. Um, we, we heard of lost learning. We know about the need to get our students back into a classroom. So the beauty of the collaboration of Think Together is the students will be working with teachers and staff in person. Uh, we have these enhancement opportunities and support opportunities for students who are rising grades 1 through 12, which is essentially current grades kindergarten through 11. We also have an opportunity for credit recovery and advancement um, for current grades 8 through 12. So tentatively, our school sites for this upcoming summer will be for grades current grades K through six, Murray, Paramount, Hodge. We will be combining Dalton and Lee, uh, but it would be actually at Lee. We will be combining Magnolia and Powell, but actually at Powell. Combining Ellington and Valleydale, but actually at Valleydale. For current grades seven through 12, we will be having a larger environment at our two high schools, Azusa High School and Glasson, two comprehensive high schools. So our middle school offerings will actually be at the high schools. I pass this now to um, Dr. Dana Mitchell. Thank you. So Dr. Linda Darling Hammond recently wrote um, an article uh, that was published in Forbes about how districts can accelerate learning as we build back better. And she wrote about how districts must aim for reinvention to address equity and opportunity gaps, not based on remediation, but rather on what we know about how students learn effectively. So there was five critical, important evidence-based areas that she wrote about that support this notion. The first one is about positive relationships and attachments are the essential ingredient that catalyzes healthy development and learning and enables resilience from trauma. The second one was around learning is social, emotional, and academic. And children learn best when they feel that they're safe, affirmed, and deeply engaged within a supportive community of learners. The third idea was around learning enhan is enhanced by physical activity, joy, and opportunities of self-expression. The fourth is around students' perception of their own ability to influence learning. All children are motivated to learn the next set of skills for which they are ready. Few are motivated by labels that rank them against others or communicate stigma. And the fifth one, Children actively construct knowledge by connecting what they know to what they are learning within their cultural context. Creating those connections is key to learning. One of the evidence-based strategies that uh, Darling Hammond and many others indicate as high leverage that supports these evidence-based assertions is through project-based learning. Project-based learning has many benefits. It promotes students' ability to transfer learning. It increases the development of critical thinking and reasoning. It's associated with improved motivation toward learning. And it's also a high leverage strategy for our emergent bilingual and our international students as well. It supports academic language, encourages collaboration, and can scaffold the structure and the function of language and gives language relevance and context as well. Plus it's engaging and it's rigorous. So our summer programming is built around project-based learning. Students in primary grades will be using the Sobrato Early Academic Language Curriculum, also known as SEAL, which not only supports the development of academic language, but it's also project-based. In grades two through seven, our students are going to engage in literacy-based project-based uh, project learning that includes something called story design. And story design combines STEM and English language arts. So essentially the students will be reading grade level literature. They identify a conflict in the literary text and they identify a problem in the text that could have a practical, physical or technological solution. Then they design and propose a solution incorporating STEM topics. 
they construct, they test, they improve a prototype of their solution, and then they communicate that out to the class and present. So um, just wanna give you a couple quick examples. Um, in, in the early grades, one of the texts is, um, is called After the Fall, How Humpty Dumpty Got Back Up Again. And the students, the project they design is an egg protection, which if you remember from the last board meeting, our engineering students, that's exactly what they did, right? With origami math, um, they were able to design these protections. So this is the same um, concept, but it's for, for younger learners. Um, another one, another um, piece of literature is Tale of Despero. And that project, after they read the story, the students actually design a lighting system. So we've got all kinds of these examples um, where students are reading literature and then they get to do these really neat STEM um, projects as well. Um, so in addition to um, the uh, elementary grades, uh, K through uh, seven, we also have a summer bridge program, um, and that's going to use a PBL model, um, as well as high school courses as well. And uh, Mr. Chang, when we turn it back over to him, he'll um, talk about a little bit about that as well. Uh, Mr. Chang, you want to go to the next slide? Thank you very much. So during the summer programming, Think Together is going to be working with us side by side. So we'll be rotating groups of our literacy, project-based learning, and Think Together programming. And Think Together is going to be providing enrichment uh, courses uh, and modules for all of our students. Um, it includes a fitness module. It includes um, a visual and performing arts module. And it also includes a STEM enrichment model as well. And so um, one of the, um, the elementary STEM uh, enrichment model is called um, Invention Adventure. And that is a very creative interdisciplinary STEM course. Um, and then the, uh, the STEM course that the secondary students will get to participate in is called Drone Blocks. And so the students are going to get drone kits and they're gonna learn about programming. Um, and so that sounds like that's gonna be super fun and engaging. Um, also, I uh, think Together is going to offer um, driver's education um, to the students, yes, who, um, and that they work with um, State Farm. And so State Farm actually has a curriculum. And so students can take that and that would count as their driver's education course before they, you know, do the behind the wheel thing. So I now I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to, uh, back to Mr. Chang. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. Um, so um, Dr. Mitchell covered some of the high school offerings, um, but there is a threaded component um, and the threaded component um, includes uh, SEL, uh, mindfulness, avid inspired strategies, the social awareness aspect, um, project citizen. Um, we, as Dr. Mitchell had mentioned, the STEM aspect, which is drone backs, um, life skills, um, Dr. Mitchell had mentioned driver's ed. So you can see that there are comprehensive offerings for the high school, uh, the secondary. Um, a critical piece for the high school program or the secondary program are the learning supports. Um, there will be credit recovery courses um, for students um, in, the air, in the core content areas. And what will be very different and which aligns very well with PBL is that instead of just simply reviewing content, we are looking for skills-based learning, which will focus, focus on overarching skills, such as collaboration, critical thinking, and communication, with specific focus on ELA and ELD standards, um, standards of mathematical practice, and science and engineering practices. Um, we'll go into a little more detail in the next slide, but I wanted you to know that it's not just going to be a repeat of content. Um, we are going to be focused on the skills that are necessary and the standards outline those skills, those overarching skills the students need to be successful, not just in the content area, but in life in general. And that means how to justify your arguments with evidence. That means how to cite your evidence as support. Those are some of the skill sets that are across all content areas. We're also offering summer bridge programs for our incoming ninth grade students. Um, these students will get both language arts and math support, as well as um, some way to introduce them into the high school life. Uh, success, success skills necessary to adapt into the high school life. They will actually be receiving incoming high school elective credit. So the next slide is in relationship to the 
convergence of what I just mentioned. Um, the ELA standards, the EOD standards, the science and engineering practices, and the um, uh, standards of mathematical practices. These are the key elements dictated by our um, educational frameworks for the CDE. But as you can see, there's a convergence of these skills across these disciplines. And you might be wondering how does social studies play into this? Well, uh, social studies actually goes hand in hand oftentimes with the anchor standards for ELA. Um, to further this discussion, I'm actually gonna bring on uh, Mr. Fernandez, principal at Glassman High School, as he has been working with High Tech High regarding project-based learning. And so um, Mr. Fernandez, if you can talk a little bit more about how PBL and skills-based learning align. All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Chang. Uh, just real briefly, we, this week we've been doing some reflection on what we've done here in the distance learning model with project-based learning so far this year at Gladstone. And what, what the teachers are finding is that the students are more excited, more apt to engage in higher level thinking, higher level application of their knowledge and skills and something that traditionally we see in summer school often becomes like a drill and kill approach to to work, but um, with this model, we're really looking to reignite passion for learning as we start to reimagine our kids coming back to school. I think that's critically important for all of our learners in Azusa Unified to feel that love for learning again when we get to see our teachers in real life. And PBL, those of you who know the theory and the practice of it, um, it really is about making relevant, rigorous, authentic learning experiences for kids so that they want to perform at high levels. And I think we're on the road to doing that with uh, Dr. Mitchell's leadership and Mr. Chang's leadership. Thank you, Mr. Fernandez. So um, we have one last component. Um, it's actually um, the component that I wanna talk about in regards to Citrus College, which, is, which will be entirely virtual and online. This is another opportunity for our students. There's two sessions. It's for current grades nine through 12, and it's gonna be focused on core academic courses and this will be for credit recovery and grade improvement. Now, as I mentioned previously, Think Together will be in person, but the Citrus College offerings will be entirely virtual and online. In total, we hope to service, well, the opportunities are available to all of our students, um, but we definitely hope to service as many students who are interested, and we can always increase the capacity to ensure that our students are, are their needs are met. So I've, quite, I've covered quite a bit in a short amount of time. Um, I definitely am open to any kind of questions or any discussions that you might have. Yeah, I have, I have several questions. Um, so the first question is really around, um, what is slide? It's slide number um, seven, right? So with the Summer Bridge Program, um, I see we talk about I really appreciate earlier you talk about accelerated learning, right? You quote Leonard Allen Hammond, but then I see embedded in our approach, mm -hmm. um, math and reading intervention, right? So let's let's be true to, if we're gonna have a vision for accelerated learning, let's embed that in at the actual, the, court, the, the opportunities that kids have and make sure that those are not only called accelerated learning, but also designed to be accelerated learning and not intervention mm -hmm. classes. Yeah, they good. think, and I think that's really important because it's too easy to fall back into just old patterns, right? So just one yeah. thing I want to highlight. Um, I, I actually should have said this is this is really amazing. Just overall, I think the approach it's exciting. Kids are going to get can get up to nine weeks of really amazing engagement. So I wanted to say that first before I start. I should have said that first. Apologies. Um, the other piece I have a question about um, um, for either. Um, Dana or Frank um, or even Gabriel. So we talked about, you, you talk about the high school courses are going to be um, skills-based, right? So uh, could you just talk a little bit more about that? Is that gonna, you're talking about like competency-based or, or is it, or are you refer, you're referencing the project-based learning approaches? What is, what is it that you're referencing when you say it's gonna be skills-based versus content learning, which we normally do, right, with credit recovery? All right, so I can start and then I can definitely pass on to Gabriel in regards to the PBL portion. Um, but this chart, this diagram right here focuses on the specific skill sets within each of the content areas. These are the overarching skills um, that um, are for each framework. 
um, might it be the math um, frameworks or the science frameworks or the ELA standards frameworks. They all align with the overarching skill sets that we mentioned earlier of critical thinking, communication, and collaboration, which also parallel very nicely with PBL. And this is when I want to turn this over to Gabriel. Um, PBL with the overarching skills um, is, is a very, very good parallel. Yeah, so, right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chang. So one of the things that we're seeing at the high school right now with the, the PBL work that our teachers and our students are doing is with that emphasis on skills, for example, our leadership team, leadership students are partnering with our graphic arts teacher and partnering with uh, avid teacher and they're working on the speaking skills, they're working on video production skills, all that goes into the communication with a lot of collaboration and critical thinking involved. And again, the level of effort that we're seeing out of kids, the level, uh, the depth of, of the work quality that we see, it's not just the coverage, because I know you've seen summer school before and you're just going through chapter after chapter, chapter after chapter, just to cover standards and you're going at it very minimally without much depth that doesn't require much abstract thinking where our students really are engaged in authentic tasks. There's something that would translate to real world applications after high school. And I think that is intrinsically motivating to students to raise their achievement level. And as uh, Sheila Nina is saying, um, accelerate their learning. Cause I think that's one of the main areas to focus is to see our students shine getting ready for 21, 22. So I think I heard you tell me that the skills are gonna be demonstrated through project-based learning that align with, um, with the diagram that you have here. That's, is that, that's, that's what's gonna be happening, okay. Um, the, my last question is around the Citrus College piece, right? And I understand there is separate entity. So I have two questions. One, are students um, getting college level credit for this or is this just high school credit? And then two, is this, are these virtual opportunities gonna be aligned to that vision you just outlined around, around being engaging and project-based or is this very much um, gonna be more like we normally see in summer credit recovery? Right, so these are non-credit classes for high school credit recovery. So okay. they will be getting credit recovery for graduation purposes of high school. Um, mm -hmm. So the curriculum is actually varied. Um, we were going to open it up to both the Apex Online curriculum as well as the current curriculum that the teachers are using, um, strictly because of the familiarity. Um, last year, we had strictly Apex Online for credit recovery, but this year, with our teachers now much more adept at online virtual learning, they will be actually able to um, embed um, our current curriculum um, to these virtual um, opportunities. And so it will be a variety. Um, it will be a variety. And because it is more virtual, um, it, it, will, it will be um, synchronous, asynchronous, as well as um, um, very um, specified time for direct instruction. Okay, thank you. And then my last question, Dana, is, more, is around special ed, right? So, you know, often during the summer, we see um, we have classes because, because of, for whatever, with IEPs, there that we have to give we have to give them instruction throughout yeah. the school year. So where are those students going to be? Are they going to be in those separate classrooms? Um, which you know, when I walk through them in previous summers, right, it's it's mm -hmm. it's sort of disappointing to see that and then see what the STEM kids were getting right. Or where are they going to be integrated into, into the summer learning? Where where are they going to end up? So yeah, so we have extended school year, right? And the students who are in extended school year are going to have the same exact program that everyone is having, right? So they're going to get the project based, they're going to have um, the think together enrichment, all of all of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I just, I just have a question regarding, um, so in person, so the parents are not having um, options of doing distant learning at all during summer school? The option for distance learning will be only at the high school credit recovery and grade improvement um, with collaboration at Citrus College. The Citrus, yeah, the Citrus. Okay, well, that was my, okay. So they don't have an option to, elementary do not have an option to um, distant learning. And then my second question was, uh, think together. 
is that only in the morning and the afternoon or is that during the whole day? Um, what, what Think Together is offering, is this only an after school program? No, it's actually the entire program will be from eight to three every single day. Oh. Um, the only day that we will be taking off is July 5th to respect the uh, July 4th holiday. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. I'll just add Those that this is, um, this, we've, we've designed this very differently. We work with things and they've been just tremendous partners to really, you know, meet our needs. But what we're excited about is to be able to offer this concurrently, right? So one group will be with a credential teacher doing project-based learning. Another group will be doing the, you know, the STEM activities or the physical education or the VAPA, and then they switch. Right. So the classes okay. will be a little smaller, but then they'll have an opportunity just throughout the day from, you know, to be able to engage in this. And so we're, we're excited about it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And so I, I actually just had some, some questions um, for driver's education. I, I think that's, that's a great partnership um, for, for high school students. And what age can these students, you know, participate in this class? You know, it's been so long, so I don't want to misspeak um, for driver's ed. Um, so I, I can definitely find out and then get back to you on that. Okay. La last I remember, for me, it's been a long time as well, but um, having an 18-year-old, I, I believe it was 15 and a half. So, so can you please just check on that and, and make sure that our students that are around that age get, you know, the, the notice the, and the, um, you know, the um, availability of them to be able to register for, for that class. And how does that impact um, ECP students as, as well, if, 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 um, if, that, if they can go ahead and take that class? Um, uh, how, how looking at how we have, um, you know, group A, group B right now, um, with safety protocol, PPE. So are we looking to, to also, I, I know that we're opening up, um, state is opening up June 15th, but what does that look like in our classroom, right? We're, we're inviting students to come. What is the ratio? What, you know, I didn't, I didn't hear any of that. So yeah. could you great question. And right now it's 20 to one. And so that's what the, that's what we're going with the guidance right now. Um, but that could change, right? I mean, it could change uh, depending on if the, you know, if the protocols, uh, you know, if they do change. Uh, are, are we going to um, ask them to, to, to still wear the mask? Oh, or, yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm, you know, I, I apologize for not talking about that, but absolutely. Right. So we're still, we're still practicing, you know, distancing in the classroom as it relates to the protocol mask, you know, masks, uh, hand sanitizing, all of that. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Great. And um, when can parents, start deciding if they want to bring their kids today it went out to i know it yeah oh, it went exciting. out today so we're excited we're starting to we're, we're registering uh, registering students so um it is in peach jar and i believe it went out in the um, parent communication as well so and it'll be on social media and then we'll also be just you know doing this frequently to let you know families know so, um and then also it's going the information goes to the sites and so we have our principals and community liaisons you know, just encouraging parents, um, it, you know, all are welcome to attend. To fill the application. They can choose all three sessions. They can choose one session. Yep, sure can. It, it, wow, yeah. the, I want to go. <laughs> I know, it sounds like <laughs> it's going to be great. Yeah, we're super, we're super excited. Um, and I'm just really thankful to, to, uh, to the Ed Services team, um, to, uh, uh, you know, Mr. Chang for, um, you know, for o overseeing and just facilitating this um, and, and everybody on the Ed Services team. And also just I'd like to say thank you to to Principal Fernandez. Um, the work that they've been doing at Glasgow High School with this pilot with project based learning um, has truly been inspirational. Um, we've been able to see, you know, some of the projects and um, I'm just very appreciative of the work that um, the teachers are doing at Glasgow High with this and paving the way um, because this is this is very exciting work um, for us to be able to do district wide and we're looking forward to it. And just was one last thing, just, just to be clear. Um, uh, drinking fountains, I mean. I, and I'm bringing this up because it's going to be warm, right? I mean, so it's important that, you know, well, we still have that bring your own bottle. I know for a fact that some um, schools have actually given students right now um, water bottles. Mm -hmm. And so they, you know, and they're writing their names on it and mm -hmm. they can clip them on there. And so I, I think that's great. And so, um, you know, kind of 
if they can just let the parents know, so just, just, just so they're aware it's going to be hot in the summer. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. great idea. Thank and, you. And also we you're talking about uh, 20 to one, it's mm-hmm. not determined on the capacity of the classroom like before, like how many mm-hmm. um, this fit in one, not necessarily anymore. Actually, right now with the 20 to one, that's the recommendation for with Think Together. That's what they, um, that's what their protocols when you are working in um, like an, as an after school, like a, you know, a service provider, um, it's 20 to one. So it just recently went up, I think maybe a couple of weeks ago, it might've been 15. So, but as things change, you know, we might be able to increase. But the disc will still have to be three feet apart. Now it's three feet, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, right? That's where we're at right now. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, just one last question. Um, you know, as we just think about partnerships, and I really appreciate that we're deepening our partnership with Think Together. Um, what, um, have we had any conversations with the city, right? So they often have summer programming, um, you know, they have like a day camp and do other things. So have we initiated those conversations? And if not, like, I think I would, I would appreciate it if we could be engaging them, because I think this is a, this could be a time and space to build those strength and those partnerships with them as well. Got it. We, I haven't, um, I do, I am aware that they are working on their summer programming, but, um, we'll definitely, we can reach out to, uh, to the city, Mickey Carpenter, um, and talk about our programming and see how we might, you know. Okay. I'm even thinking about like swimming, like, you know, it'd be be great to be able to incorporate that into it, you know, summer swimming as part of summer learning, right? We have a scheduled ad hoc next, next week. Um, so we can bring that up. Okay. That'd be good. Mm -hmm. Oh, Okay. Will Great. Do. Thank you guys for all, all your input and um, your enthusiasm. And thank you, um, Mr. Uh, Frank Chang, um, Mr. Fernandez and Dana for, for this. I, it's really exciting. So, you know, seeing our schools open up and being able to provide instruction and the kids are really excited to come back um, seeing that. So as there is no further discussion or comments, I will go ahead and move on to 13.2. 2021 Azusa Unified School District Annual Survey Presentation. We have Ms. Jen Edick Bryan. Hello, hello, sorry about that. I was uh, still muted. I am going to start my um, presentation for you because this evening I am uh, very excited to be able to um, bring you, actually, hold on just a minute. Let me escape. There we go. Uh, Very excited to bring you our uh, district annual survey results. And so tonight I'm I'm gonna borrow a, a, word from baseball and say that I am your closer and going to walk you through some a general broad overview of our district uh, annual survey of results. So this year we partnered with an organization called Youth Truth to administer our student, parent and family and staff surveys. And one of the benefits of partnering with them, uh, in addition to some additional questions that we were able to ask that they had developed Uh, for our use is also to be able to have some comparisons with state and national data. So we still get that same solid data for our schools that we can look at our own um, schools and levels and then also do some comparison, uh, some comparing. And some of that I'm going to show you um, this evening. Just a quick, uh, quick note, Youth Youth Truth is actually a nonprofit organization started in 2008, a partnership with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And as the Gates Foundation was pouring money into um, educational plants and projects, they they wanted to find a way to really measure progress. And so that was kind of the birth of of this this, uh, organization, this arm that begins to survey students. And then they expanded that to also create surveys for parents and for staff. And so you can see from this slide they, that when, as we talk about our comparisons, we're talking about you know, 1.75 million students that have taken the surveys that we're able to, to look at and compare with our students across 38 states. Um, there are over 300,000 families and staff that we also get to tap into that comparison data. So we're really excited to be, um, to be partnering with them 
And this is our first year and we look, look forward to ongoing uh, partnership in the coming years. So let's look a little bit at Azusa's uh, data and our response rates are, are what I'm sharing with you here on this slide. Um, our, our rates, especially for students, are very, very high. Our principals and teachers do a great job providing opportunities and encouraging students to take the survey. There were 1,134 more students who participated this year. Um, compared to last year. And part of that is also that we added third through fifth graders to our survey um, pool. Um, our staff participation increased 787. Uh, that, I'm sorry, it's, it's 787 and it, it is um, up from 769 in the previous year. And our parent and family response numbers increased by 724 from last year's survey. So I know you're looking at some percentages in this slide. And, um, and the reason you see a 28% response rate, it's really hard for us to gauge exactly how many parents we have. Um, so what we used to calculate that 28% was just the number of students we had. And we know that a lot of our families have multiple children. Um, Youth Truth shoots for about the 28 to 30% rate for parents. So we're within that uh, as well. And so um, overall, we had a, a, an increase in total participation. Uh, we had 7,638 7, individuals participate. And as always, this continues to be um, exceed a 99% confidence level and 5% margin of error in our, our results. So, so let me share a few of um, the survey results. And our survey questions were categorized by themes and so it's the theme level data that you're seeing on this slide. The percentages here reflect the percent of parents responding positively. And so, you know, as if we're asking questions, and this is our family survey that I'm going to share with you first, they have a, you know, a five Likert scale choice. And so the positive responses are the, you know, agree, strongly agree, those top two. And so um, you can see that we have six uh, key themes that the questions fall into that we're looking at. Just a quick review of those so you understand what, what these themes are, are um, talking about. Is that engagement describes the degree to which our families um, are engaged in their school and empowered to influence decision making. Relationships uh, describes the degree to which families experience positive relationships in their school based on respect, care, approachability. Culture uh, really describes the degree to which families believe their schools foster shared goals, respect, <clears throat> fairness, diversity. Communication and feedback describes the degree to which uh, there are open and effective communication uh, lines between families and schools. And resources describes the degree to which families believe their schools deploy necessary resources to support students. And then school safety describes the degree to which families believe their school's a safe place for students. So the data you can see on this slide shows you in the orange, our district's, um, our district's uh, percent of positive responses. And then this is a little bit of that comparison I was talking about. You can see in yellow, the typical youth truth school. So that's a national comparison and then a typical California school. And that's just looking at schools in California. And you can see our results and our parents' levels of positive um, responses are, are really about the same um, as, as others nationally and in the state. And you can see they're also very high rates. This, oh, by the way, the previous slide was our elementary parents. This slide is now our middle school parents. And we're able to look at the data in, in different groups and again, you're, you're able to see similar results from our, you know, with our elementary parents, um, middle school parents are, are on par with, um, with the comparisons. Um, some of the highlights here include our parent positive responses in the area of relationships and communication and feedback. If we look at high school parents who have responded, um, again, seen fairly high rates. Um, we do have some real areas of, of strong positive uh, rates in the, uh, the relationship theme and the communication and feedback theme. And those are even higher than, um, than you see compared to nation and state numbers. 
So transitioning to our student survey results, we're gonna start with themes for our elementary students. Um, let me just do a quick description of these themes, very similar to the parents, but I don't want there to be any confusion. So engagement really is the degree to which students perceive themselves as engaged with their school and their education. Academic challenge is the degree to which students feel they're challenged by their coursework and their teachers. Relationships uh, describes the degree to which students feel they receive support and personal attention from their teachers. Culture describes the degree um, to which students believe their schools foster a culture of respect, fairness, and diversity. Uh, instructional methods describes strategies and approaches students report uh, their teachers using in classes. And belonging and peer collaboration describes the degree to which students feel welcome at their school and have collaborative relationships with their classmates. So an analysis of data on this slide shows our general areas of strength, such as engagement and relationships. Also points to areas such as academic challenge and culture. Uh, it, these are areas of uh, interesting to compare also. Um, we, we see that uh, in culture where our schools are, are higher, but uh, you know, we have, when we look at all of the themes, we also can see some of the lower levels like culture, uh, looking at our own internal data between, um, between all of the themes, just looking at Azusa. So this is um, our elementary students. So middle school students um, had slightly lower responses, which over time has not been um, different. We usually see lower positive responses as we move up through the grades. Um, you also see that reflected in the comparison uh, with the state and national um, results that are on this slide. Um, academic challenge is higher and comparable to other schools and districts. And so that's, that's an area of, of uh, kind of success that we can celebrate. So, sorry to, to interrupt, um, Ms. Jen Edick Bryant. I, I, I do want to bring the time up to, to our board. We do have a policy at 1030. Um, I do want to honor that, but at the same time, I see that you're almost halfway through and we're kind of, you know, um, looking at the time as well. I, I would like to go ahead and put it out on the table, uh, a motion to extend 15 minutes at the 1045, not to, you know, not to exceed. Um, we don't have to take all the 15 minutes, but if it's a minute or two after 1030, at least we, we have decided on that. Um, can I please get a motion to, to move to 1045 for adjournment of our meeting? Uh, actually, can, can I ask first? I'm curious, I'm curious to know if, if uh, Jen, if, if you feel like we can, how, how, how are you looking with the rest of the time that you have for your presentation? Maybe we can. Um, I'm, a, I'm probably halfway done. The, the slides at the end are a little more uh, detailed and complex. Um, so I think I, I, I will, I can commit to definitely ending at 10.30 if you'd like me to do that. And then if you'd like me to come back or you'd like to reach out individually, I'm more than happy to walk through in more detail or answer questions um, at a later time. So I, I, again, I'm gonna put it on the table. Um, it just she, like she said, she's halfway through, she'll end at 10.30, but if we have a couple of questions, it might go just you know two to five minutes at the most. Um, so I'm putting out in the motion, uh, to motion to be able to move um, our adjournment to uh, 1045. Sure. Can I please get a first? Um, I'm so moved. Okay. Yes. And so I have a first uh, uh, board member Greer, second board member uh, Bo. All in favor, please raise your hand. Aye. Okay, five zero. Thank you so much for and letting me interrupt you. Just wanted to make sure that we are all on, uh, on, uh, on gear here and please continue. Um, and now that we get this. Okay, yeah, no problem. No problem at all, thanks. Um, we were looking at the high school results on this slide and then just talking about, uh, again, that lower level for our high school students, but still actually very high and, and obviously in comparison to other high school students, um, very typical. When we look at our staff surveys, uh, the themes, again, very similar, engagement, the degree to which staff feel engaged in their work and empowered to influence schools, relationships are the degree to which staff feel uh, positive relationships 
in their school based on respect and care and approachability, cultures the degree to which staff believe uh, their schools foster a culture of shared vision, respect and effective communication and professional development and support um, addresses meaningful feedback, opportunities to grow professionally and feel supported at work. And school safety is um, the degree to which staff feel that the school's a safe learning environment for students. And you can see the results there. Our staff um, shows higher than average compare, when compared to others across all themes. So um, this is our elementary staff. When we move to our middle school staff, uh, same themes, you can see the results on this slide. Uh, resp positive response rates are still very high when viewed in comparison to schools and districts uh, across the state. We have slightly lower positive response rates for professional development and support and school safety in, in, with our middle school staff. When we look at our high school staff uh, responses, and uh, we see that overall, the, that these also align similar to others, but also, um, again, reflect uh, some strengths that even exceed, uh, for example, culture is while it's one of maybe not our highest area, um, it is uh, higher than uh, high schools in uh, high school responses in the state and in the nation. So. So those are our overall themes that we surveyed for all of our stakeholders. Um, in addition, we remember used the opportunity with our district annual survey and with our partnership with Youth Truth to gather baseline data for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so this is really from an, the Ed Services perspective as we talk about you know, how that is being um, kind of materialized in our classrooms. We wanted to get the baseline understanding of our, of our staff, of our, our parents and families, and then really importantly of our students. We've heard many of them share with us. And so this is some, um, some, some additional data that will help guide us as we plan for our 21-24 LCAP season and all of the work we're gonna be doing with our DEI committee. Um, just to share a couple of examples with you, um, one of the questions asked all three stakeholder groups um, the, uh, to respond as to whether or not they feel encouraged to speak out against racism. And our students and parents had similar positive response rates at about 58%. And our staff positive response rate was 66%. So that gives us a good baseline that we can grow from. Um, we also asked if schools value, schools in the district value diverse groups of people. And we gave lists of groups and had uh, the respondents rate uh, the positively if, if our, our um, schools and district um, value those groups. And so those groups included uh, people of different religions, sexual orientations, abilities, genders, family income levels, race and ethnicity, and country of origin. And um, similar levels resulted. We had a 49% uh, positive for gender. That was kind of the low end. And then a 53% positive response rate for race and ethnicity and country of origin and abilities. And that's with our, um, with our families and students. That, so it's right in that middle range. And, and staff rated these things a little bit higher while the, the student and the parent responses tended to be mid-level around between about 45 and 55, maybe some 60s on some questions. Our staff was in the mid 70s to 80s. So that's really great baseline data for us to start with, to use, to dig into deeply as we're planning um, the areas, which really is all areas of our functioning and our, our instruction uh, that deals with data equity and inclusion. So Youth Truth allows us to really disaggregate and pick out differences. And one of the things that the staff at Youth Truth told me is that as they went through our data and were looking at it, they were, they were surprised that we had no real trends of, of student group gaps. For, what that means is there wasn't one group in particular that across the board seemed to be um, lower or higher than any others. And so as we looked through them, we did have some that had several um, differences, 
but we kind of picked out a few of the differences that we could pinpoint and look at. And so when we look at elementary school data, this is some of the disaggregated data that we, um, we were able to uh, observe. Um, there was some race and ethnicity data that we kind of took a look at, knowing that uh, the, the groups that you see on this slide combined make up about less than 2% of our population, which mathematically can mean differences uh, that go up and down uh, more greatly. Uh, nonetheless, it really also gives us pause to dig in and see is what can we do? How can we make sure that even those groups with the smallest numbers have their needs addressed? And so with race and ethnicity, we see those uh, groups kind of at the lower level of the themes. And other than that, the majority of race and ethnicities, uh, very little trends that are consistent. Um, no trends really existed between gender identity, uh, identification with students and um, elementary, although they did not uh, have that question, but homeless youth and virtual academy uh, wasn't different. Uh, and we did allow students to indicate whether they were in virtual academy or, and, and that was an interesting way to dig into the data. Sixth grade level and seventh grade, or sixth grade uh, level, we noticed some differences with the academic challenge theme. And I wanna dig in a little bit deeper than that because we noticed that our sixth graders were, um, had some lower uh, response, positive response rates. So this, this slide that I am showing you right now, um, I wanna kind of walk you through it because as we move into our partnership with Youth Truth, we're all going to have to learn a little bit more about how to look at and, and really decipher the data that, that they're able to share with us. So I'm gonna just pull up a little pen here. And um, what I wanna show you, this is the academic challenge summary where we saw sixth graders with lower response rates. And so this orange bar, the orange bar, um, artistic skills could use some work, but the orange bar is the national results. And what it shows when you look at this white box, this is where Azusa um, elementary students fall. It's an average, if you, if you look at their responses, uh, there's three levels, a one, two, and three, a low and a positive response. And we average 2.6 if you add up those scores. And this puts Azusa at the 78th percentile. And what that means is that when we look across the nation, all of the students in, in um, elementary schools that took this survey uh, and this theme, 78% of them had lower positive responses when compared to Azusa's. Mm -hmm. So we get this nice percentile. And then the gray, um, the gray bar that you see underneath, and that's this one right here, this is just California schools. And then you can see the midpoint, the average for California schools. So when you look at these, you're comparing and can see Azusa when compared nationally and Azusa when compared to the average of California schools for elementary. So that's the way we read these, um, these wow. bar charts. So digging into this academic challenge, we see over here with the sixth grade as we disaggregate the data, we see lower positive response rates. And in particular, you see that with this relevance question, which is, does what you learn in class help you uh, outside of school? And so you can see this is the biggest difference with 37% for our sixth graders. So one of the benefits of, of working with Youth Truth is this comparison. And then what we can do internally is begin to dive into these differences, figure out where we can address the needs that are um, represented by them. And then also celebrate the successes, um, you know, when we look at differences and, and changes. So this was our elementary um, data. Similarly, we, we were able to look at the disaggregated data for, um, for middle school students. And this gives you a little bit of that disaggregated data. Got some grade level differences, some race and ethnicity differences. We have a difference with other special education uh, students who actually rate higher positive rates in all themes uh, than their general education classes. And then we looked at some gender identity differences. And if we dug, dig into those, we can see that um, 
our, our girls in particular, when compared to, uh, to those that identify as male, um, have lower response rates in the belonging and peer uh, collaboration measure. And so when we break that down, we can look at those numbers. And in particular, when we look at the questions here that make up the, uh, the questions that are in the belonging and peer collaboration summary, um, we can see the, the biggest difference is in this question about being myself. And uh, when we compare uh, students who identify as female to students who identify as male. And then also we see students that identify another way also with lower levels. And this allows us to dig in and, and plan for addressing those needs. And just again, as following this example, we're looking at some high school um, disaggregated data. We can see here with uh, the differences between students who come from families uh, who, are, who are low income families, some gender identity differences, and then some race and ethnicity differences. Uh, one of the things that kind of surfaced was that our black and African-American students um, rated lowest in culture and college and career readiness. So again, if we dig into the college and career readiness uh, measure as an example, we can look at everybody at the top, getting some comparisons and then breaking this out by ethnic group, we can see and, and part, uh, focus in on our, um, our African-American students here and across the board see much lower and, and I would say statistically significantly lower rates where despite that being a very small population in Azusa is something that, you know, is, is that we would want to address and that we can share with schools uh, as they're beginning to make plans and look at ways that they're going to be um, improving for students and, and also addressing diversity, equity and inclusion. So I brushed through some of the more complex uh, slides, uh, but let me tell you a little bit about what is next. We have an executive summary that is being prepared by Youth Truth and, and that will be shared with the board. And then I'm very excited about uh, to, uh, next Wednesday, not tomorrow, next Wednesday's uh, meeting uh, with our principals where Youth Truth will come in and be doing a virtual principal workshop so that our site leaders can now um, become oriented to the new data, uh, the different ways that we can now look at the data and the ways that we can now compare. And so that, that session will really help our principals look at the data, dig into it and prepare to share it. And then most importantly, use it and act on it to, to build their school plans and to begin to address um, needs with our, with our schools. So um, thank you so much for extending the time and for allowing me to share kind of this, this broad overview with you this evening. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Jen Edith Bryant for this awesome presentation. We'll go ahead and start with questions, comments. I, I mean, I have questions, but I can just follow up um, and maybe mm -hmm. come back at, at a, in a future board meeting. Mm -hmm. Happy to do so. Any at, at, at this point? Um, I, I, I would have to agree. Um, I, I just just want to comment that this is great um, to let us know where we are in the nation, where we are in California. Uh, th this is amazing. And so um, I do have some some questions and, and comments, but I, I think it's important. We can go ahead and just bring this back just uh, this next um, board meeting just for us to be able to discuss a little further, because um, uh, I know that I have a few Things, and I know other board members do as well, and just to respect everyone's time. At this point, um, thank you again uh, mm -hmm. for your presentation, and we will be coming back. If you can please come and join us at the next board meeting, um, just to, to, you know, to, um, to keep going um, with our comments and comment, uh, questions that we, we have um, on this agenda item. Um, at this moment, we will go ahead and move to uh, 14.1 adjournment. Can I please get a motion to please move 14.1? So moved. Second. We have a first by board member Sabrina Bow. We have a second by board member Greer. If we can all please submit our vote. Hand. hand? Okay. Yes. Oh, yeah. 
Okay, hand, since some of us are. Okay, I said yes. Sir. Oh, okay, did not hear you. Thank you so much. Well, it's a five zero, it passes. Therefore, it is 1036 and Azusa Unified School District Board meeting for April 20th, 2021 is adjourned. Thank you for joining us tonight. Have a great, have a great rest of your night. We hope to see you guys at our next board meeting. Take care. Bye-bye.